Hello and welcome to the Cuyamonga Institute, our Q&A Conversation for Exploration series. I'm Paul Robert, the Executive Director and President of the Institute, and along with my wife, Laura Lee, the Director of Research, Education and Outreach, we want to thank you for joining us today on behalf of our Board of Directors, our advisors, our volunteers, and our supporting members. Um, the Cuyamonga Institute is an independent, nonprofit research organization committed to researching consciousness and the human experience following the footsteps of our founder, anthropologist, Dr. Felicitas Goodman. And as an educational institution, we take a very open approach and we invite scholars in related fields to help broaden the scope of our own work and exploration. And that's why we call this segment Conversation for Exploration. And on these Sunday discussions, we've had a full spectrum of topics from neuroscience, anthropology, art history, archaeology, mythology, archaeoastronomy, and much, much more. And you're welcome to visit our website at queermongainstitute.com. All of our presentations are free. And as a nonprofit, of course, we invite you to become a supporting member. And we want to thank you, the community members who continue to support the mission of the Queermonga Institute. Today, we are pleased to have the return visit of Tyler Volk. We spoke several times over the years, but last month we had a wonderful, insightful, and lively discussion into the underlying patterns of the universe. And today we asked him back, bring your slideshow, and specifically explore the concept of meta patterns. And so what is meta patterns? A meta pattern is a pattern of patterns, a large scale pattern of other patterns. So in the broadest sense, the study of meta patterns embraces both nature and culture, seeking out the grand scale of patterns um, that help explain the functioning of our universe. From a complexity science point of view, meta patterns are the embedded and emerging patterns in the natural world. And if you take a glance at the chapter list in Tyler's book, Meta Patterns Across Space, Time and Mind, patterns such as spheres, sheets, tubes, borders, binaries, centers, layers, calendars, um, arrows, breaks, and cycles. And so Tyler will break this all down for us with an in-depth slideshow. He draws upon an astounding range of material from art, architecture, philosophy, mythology, biology, geometry, and more. And of course, if you don't know this, Tyler Volk is the Emeritus Professor of Environmental Studies in Biology at New York University. Well, our um, interest in patterns runs deep, and we understand these as symbols. We use them a lot as symbols, social functions. We conceptually dance with patterns, but their dynamical functions are so interesting. It's in the very fabric of how nature unfolds and shapes itself, both on the animate and the inanimate level, on the molecular level to the astronomical level, level macro to microcosm, and that's where we begin to glimpse the secrets of the universe. To understand that, you understand us a little more. And I always say nature is my favorite artist, and this study of patterns confirms for me in a mythopoetic way, my degree was in English literature with a lot of art history, um, that meta patterns, patterns are among nature's palette, that all we see and all we are are her creations, her art. And to understand how she creates is to celebrate creation and our place in it, in her art. So yes, Tyler is a biologist, but one of his gifts is to look at whole systems in a cross-disciplinary way, to see the relations of parts, which he did for us in our last talk with combogenesis, looking at how the patterns relate and the new relationships that form. But we've asked him back to look at the patterns themselves and all that he does. Meta patterns, it's a really fun book. Meta patterns, indeed, across time, space, and mind. To look at all the patterns and all the ways that they express themselves is just bedazzling to the brain. So, back by popular demand, welcome, Tyler. Thanks. Thanks, Paul and Laura. Glad to be here. I feel very relaxed today, especially since it's the second time. So, uh, I know the scene and uh, we're going to have a lot of fun. Very good. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I have to mention that Tyler has also asked that after his initial talk, we're going to shut off the recording and have the after talk. Yeah, so you are invited after we officially 
Totally stop. stop. We're um, not going to close the Zoom. We're going to continue talking for the after party. And that is Tyler's idea. So I think that might be a, a new uh, open discussion, Q and A. &A yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, any and everything. So. So where do we start? Where do we start? Well, first of all, again, tell us why you're intrigued with patterns, and not just patterns, but the overarching patterns that you see over and over again. Where did that interest start for you? Well, I am going to give on, on the slideshow a little bit of, uh, I'm going to show some things from my personal history that I probably have never shown in public before okay. um, to right. try to take people into my, into my um you know, the, the insights and thought processes uh, that, that went on, uh, but it was after architecture school and looking at everything as, as design in, in a sense. So uh, I, I, there, there will be some people today that know meta patterns uh, uh, somewhat. I, there's some people who were in, involved from, with Columbia University Press. Uh, I've got some friends online that know about it, but there's some new people. There's some systems, uh, international society for system science people here today. So I do promise I have something for everybody, uh, whether they're new to meta patterns or they know uh, quite a bit. Um, so that, that's, that's, that's going to be a juicy discussion. Yeah, th that's my plan for today. Uh huh. Yeah. Um, but I but I do intend since I know Laura and Paul, you're you're interested in in the person's personal journey. Uh, and I did that a bit last last time. I'm I'm going to do some of that. Um, Perfect, for sure. Oh, um, you, you want what's the importance of patterns? Why should people care about patterns? Well, um, well, yeah. well, yeah. Just so we we we, we get to the. I'm um, looking at my notes here to make sure I I have. So so it it's it's a way of thinking. It's a way of asking questions about anything you could be interested in. So it could be a, a new, some new ways of framing questions for yourself. Uh, I also see these patterns as doorways into, uh, you know, I, hate, I, I, I hesitate to say uh, mystical experiences, but sort of a, a, a experience of oneness uh, with the universe. So they are ways to do uh, induction of, of states of consciousness that might be de uh, desirable. And, and they can be practical design uh, 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 patterns to to think about when you're designing something or designing a piece of, of something you're writing or something you're, you're 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 painting or industrial design or architecture or just talking with friends, analyzing conversations, analyzing politics. You know, I don't want to try to claim too much here, but <laughs> I hope to uh, give some uh, some justification for all this. And I want to say that we could also add the ancient symbols that we see on cave walls. We can also understand and start to decode our ancient ancestors and their art, which are containers for their cultural identity, their understanding of the universe, uh, symbols that they used anew daily, that these are so instinctive within us that we see them in, in uh, the earliest, some of the earliest art. So I like yeah, that aspect too. Def definitely, I, and I've studied some of the early art for just just for that reason. That the, the, this is glimpses into the deep mind, the origin of the of the human mind, and what what are the first pictorial expressions of that? Yeah, I think I have a bit of that today in, in there. So oh, excellent! I, not a whole lot. <laughs> cover it all. Yeah. Co 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 cover it all. Yes. Uh, this is a new talk. I I, uh, I haven't done it before. I designed it specifically for for you uh, all today. Um, and the, well, so, so, so it is a new talk. Uh, I just want to let you know that. And I intend that there's going to be a bit of introduction, uh, just general introduction to patterns. Then I'm going to go into some personal history, as I said, to some, my, when I was in my twenties, how I first came up with some of these ideas. It took me actually decades to work out. The book Meta Patterns was not until I was uh, 45 years old. So, so but some of the early ideas uh, were, were 20 years before that. Uh, I'm going to give a tour of the meta patterns. I'm gonna watch the time and I, they're, they're really rich and I, I can only touch on them all. And if I don't get through them all, that's gonna be okay because I do wanna give toward the end some call outs to other people working along similar lines of doing pattern language work and, and patterning and systems work. And there are some people online today that are going to uh, uh, get a call out and, as well as some other people who are not. And then I'm gonna end with just some examples from, and not in detail, but when I get to the NYU 
Student Journal of Meta Patterns. Uh, you'll know I'm at, I'm going to, you know, I'm at my end here. Uh, and, and I just want, that will just be an indi indication of how they can be used in various ways, uh, either by individuals or in educational possibilities. To you mentioned a pattern work. language. Christopher Alexander in Architecture is really a pivotal and really insightful book for architecture. Oh, totally. In fact, I was going to see gonna, he, one he, application he, of that. That's breakthrough. Yeah. 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 He's going to be one of the call outs today. In fact, Laura. So yeah, and, yeah, and he passed away uh, recently. Um, mm. Alexander did. So uh, yeah. yeah. Christopher okay. Alexander, yeah. a pattern language. Mm -hmm. oh, beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it just shows you how it, it, it unfolds in our lives and how we arrange cities and houses and furniture. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, Paul, Laura, just to double check, do you see that? Mm -hmm. yes. Meta patterns ring? Yes. We're okay. So, uh, so these are the meta patterns I'm going to be talking about today, uh, everyone. And thank you so much for attending uh, this talk. Uh, I don't have labels on anything yet. I will, uh, as I give the talk, uh, show you some of these patterns with names. But I show this, and I'm going to show this slide at several times during the talk as, as, as ways of transitioning. And these patterns emerged to me um, from working through an idea that one could take everything in the universe and look at everything as, as the field of study. I hope that will become clear as we talk, and certainly I'm happy to uh, entertained lots of discussion. And as I said at the beginning, uh, maybe it was before the recording, I, I, I love when there's some pushback and some, some issues that arise some controversy even because I'm trained in the sciences and I, I love when that happens. So I has to do, have to do a call out first to Gregory Bateson who coined the word meta patterns. Uh, and he used it uh, not a whole lot, in fact, only once in all his writings, but he clearly was a meta patterns thinker, uh, did work on what I would now call binary systems, uh, multiple versions of reality and uh, evolutionary dynamics uh, true to biology and culture, uh, a really superb, incredible thinker. I had the privilege of studying with him for a semester at the Lindisfarne group uh, in New York City in the um, latter, latter part of the 1970s. So that's where the word comes from. He used it to mean, as you already said, Paul, pattern, patterns of patterns. So we're talking about degrees of abstraction here. And uh, here is a, a little collage I made of his, uh, of his uh, use, his single use of the word meta pattern. And up at the top, you can see the pattern which connects is a meta pattern. It's a very famous phrase of Bateson's, the pattern which connects, the pattern which connects. He only said the word meta pattern once in his, in his writing, but it is a pattern of patterns. It is that pat meta pattern that defines the great, the vast generalization that in, indeed it is patterns that connect. Patterns can connect various um, parts of the world that you are looking at. And a little bit more background on that. A very important concept uh, is the word affordances. Um, this is a book that I really enjoyed. It's from a professor of English and uh, Carolyn Levine, and she uses the word affordances and described it very well. And she is investigating holes, rhythms, hierarchies, and networks in literature and also in sociopolitics. Uh, the word affordances means that these patterns have certain characteristics that allow the systems that embody these patterns to perform in certain ways. Mm -hmm. If a biologist might say function, uh, but the word and the word, so it's it's close to function. I, I think of it more though, not as a function that is happening, but as possibilities, functional possibilities. So another term I very much like is the idea of, of um, possibility space or affordance space or opportunity space, that these patterns 
offer opportunities for things that find the patterns. And I'm using the word thing here in the most general way. Uh, this is Helmer, Helmut Leitner. He wrote a book uh, about the work of Christopher Alexander, who we've already talked about a little bit. And Leitner's, um, he explains his use of the word pattern following Christopher Alexander. This aims at a specific form of pattern, a specific meaning, the problem solution pattern. Okay. So it's not a, he says, it's not the pattern that you might think of as a, uh, in a little bit more mundane sense of, of everyday, you know, mere pattern, that it's a, so merely a pattern. These are patterns that have inherent dynamic possibilities when they get materialized or instantiated or embodied in various things. Uh, another quote from a book I'm um, very much liking, The Human Swarm, Mark Moffat, who's an anthropologist and expert in animal societies, is looking at uh, kinds of social organizations. Uh, and he says, making comparisons is most fruitful when parallels are noticed between ideas or things or actions ordinarily treated as distinct so that, so that these can be, it can be fruitful to look at these uh, parallels, which I am uh, going to be doing today, or showing you, not just doing it, doing it actually very little, showing you some patterns that can be used to make these parallels, fruitful, fruitful parallels. Now, there are some people here from uh, the In International Institute of System Sciences. Um, which was once called the um, Society for General Systems Research. There was a strong movement on in the night, began in the 1940s, 1950s, 1960s, and it continues in general systems, general system theory. Uh, Carl von Bertalanffy was one of the founders, a biologist, but turned general systems theorist. And the term then, one of the terms was being used, it's uh, very much like meta patterns, just to show you other examples is isomorphisms. For example, one that was big for von Bertalanffy was the concept of feedbacks in different ways, feedbacks in a, a biological and, and, and ecosystems, feedbacks in human social systems, feedbacks in your own mind as you're thinking through your thought patterns and how you want your life to be, uh, you are getting feedback on it. That's a bit of introduction to the idea that patterns have inherent affordances to them, which we'll be looking at. Now I'm taking you into my personal history, and this is some material that I've never uh, shared uh, publicly and rarely in a lecture even that wasn't recorded, but uh, we're, we're, we're having fun here today. And it's, it gets me a, a way to uh, tell you some of the, how the, where these ideas began, how they began, where they began. And you see they began, the where is, me, post, little post-architecture school, uh, early 1970s, uh, having a, a geodesic dome, a, a Bucky Fuller dome in the, uh, in, in, the, in, in the woods to serve as sort of an architecture thinking studio. And I, I guess I posed myself here, uh, it's almost to look at me back in time, it's uh, it really, really dates me. Uh, but I, I was having a number of revelations at the time, just, just opening up to aspects of the universe. Uh, this I was a drawing I did for a book that never got published uh, in, that I, I was doing in my, uh, in my 20s when I was first having some of these ideas. And it shows an experience of me having an experience of everything in the universe together. This is, and now, now this is true, of course, we all know this is true, whether we're having a, a huge uh, sort of mystical moment or not. But sometimes as you many of the people on this talk probably know, the ordinary can be a doorway to the mystical and, and nothing has changed except one's experience or one's emotions to it. Uh, I sometimes call these 
uh, emo emosophical experiences where they're emotional and philosophical at the same time. So this is everything in the universe was is together. It's one universe. So we know that in the word universe. And then moreover, the next phase was that everything was in interrelationship, uh, potentially with with eyes. Now, now I have to say I'm, I am not personally a pan psychist, um, but I I, um, I mean, that can be discussed later. But but the relate this is to show that there are active relationships going on among everything in the universe. And this was a huge uh, moment for me. It, it happened in a particular way. I, I think I drew it in a simple way. I did, it wasn't on like a floor sitting on a mattress. I just tried to make the drawing simple, but it was something that was happening inside. M more moments from that time in my life. Um, the one occurred when I was walking near a grape fi a field of grapes, a vineyard, small vineyard, and it was autumn and I saw the ripe grapes um, that are on the left there. And the pr virtual perfection of the, of the spheres is what got to me. It was this, I, I can't just almost can't describe the, the moment that, because there was something about what is, what is a mathematical object doing in a biological form so perfect. And I knew that this was not, it wasn't using a, a math, you, you learn in ge geometry in high school that a sphere is the, the locus of all points that are equidistant from a center point. You know, that's not what the grape is doing. The grape is growing in this form. And furthermore, the stems of the grapevine are, um, are not spheres, and yet the cells have the same genes in those stems as in the grape. So the grape is actively choosing this shape. And around the same time, this is a drawing I did also for a book that never got published, um, in which I am standing in front of the moon that evening or a couple of evenings later, but it was right about the same time. And the moon is this perfect sphere and we, we know it, it's been worshiped for me, uh, by many cultures throughout history, uh, the, the, uh, the sun and the moon. And yet now I saw, wow, there's a sphere in geology. Now this is so simple in a sense. Okay, the grapes are spherical, the moon is spherical. You know, like you know, so what? So I, I but I, to me, it meant there might be some principles that are transcending the individual instances here, transcending biology, transcending uh, uh, geology. And there were more around the same time when I looked at spheres and, and egg, egg cases of animals, there were more uh, happening at the same time. At that same time, I started, uh, as I was doing drawings, I had a, um, I had a, almost like a, almost a voice uh, thunder down to me. And I, I can't claim it, you know, it was or thunder up from me. Maybe it's, it's up from the grape and down from the moon. And, <laughs> And it was the following, the, the, the message was the following, all things in the universe are spheres unless they are acted upon by a non-omnidirectional force. Hmm. Now, I know this sounds a lot like Newton's law or something. So I, you know, I sort of like you know, all things unless they're acted upon. But so there, I think there was a sort of a copycat thing going on there, but it was like an architectural, you treat it as a, uh, uh, omni, you know, omni useful architectural um, Newtonian type principle. And, and I, and I want to use the word force here. And, and I did use the word force very generally. So here, so here was the idea. I had this other moment in which I was sitting by a lake and everything became spherical, a swarm of insects, a tree, a cloud, the lake, a rock, and some, and they were the earth I was sitting on. And there was more, the, the big earth, uh, is, and, and they were more or less spherical. I mean, some clouds are more, the sun is more spherical, the, the, some trees are more spherical than others. The lake is, can be sort of roundish and uh, the rocks if they're tumbled. So, 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 but, but so I saw that the deviation I saw, for me, the deviation from sphericity, that's why I say non-omnidirectional forces, the deviation from sphericity, would tell you something about 
the forces acting on these on these things. And by force, I don't just mean physical force uh, from the law of physics, but these could be biological influences or biological forces. So for example, another drawing of mine, the leaf on the lower right, that is a flat surface, a high surface area, not a sphere, opposite a sphere in a sense, high surface area, because the sun is coming down in, 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 a, in, a, in a planar field of rays coming down. And the way this shape can intercept the maximum number of solar of sun rays is by being flat, being a plane to it. I guess if it lived on a, in a place where the sun was coming from all directions, uh, it, you know, we, we'd probably have it be a sphere. And, and Paul and Laura, where you live in the desert, uh, a lot of cactuses, sphere, more spherical because they're trying to conserve water. Mm -hmm. So these different biological factors can interplay with each other, the need to conserve water and the need to capture sun. And so, and again, they're not physical forces like the laws of physics. These are, these are uh, environmental opportunities. This is where the word affordance comes in or opportunities. So the flat leaf affords the, um, the function of capturing a lot of, so, a lot of sunlight. And at the upper right there, you see a plant with a stems and it's, it's got these little leaves that are not, are, are, are small planes, small flat shapes, but they're clumped, is, uh, clumped in spherical clumps because this is a good, this is an easy way to grow. And then these stems are conduits that transport nutrients and uh, uh, water in two directions and, and the photosynthetic materials up and down the plant. And that's gonna be one of the meta patterns that's gonna be coming up the tube in contrast to the sphere. And on the, on the right there, as I've abstracted them as tubes and spheres, you can see the different functions, uh, benefits for, for being close together and benefits for, for being uh, stretched apart for transportation. As I said, all things in the universe are spherical unless acted upon by non-omnidirectional uh, forces. The, the elementary things of, of fundamental physics, we do, well, we think of them right now as points. They don't seem to have insides, but they might have insides. But the nucleons, which are protons and neutrons are uh, approximately spherical. The atomic nuclei are approximately spherical. The atoms are approximately spherical because they're vibrating, even though they have their different shells. When you get to molecules, you get to the first non-spherical things and it's, it's a lot of non-spheres after that. But as I showed, you can go to something like biology and suddenly the sphere pops back into existence for Re for reasons that have to do with the benefits by, from being spherical. Um, Can I ask if, a question? Yes, please, Laura. You even say, when you talk about borders in your book, Meta Patterns, that cells encased in lipids, um, in origin of life experiments, the lipids in the water shrink wrap themselves into spheres. So there you have this combination of the dynamical forces of how atoms want to adhere in shape, but also biological. So is that just a, an example of just the natural tendency to go into spheres? Yes, the lipids, the lipids going into a, a, a bubble type shape would be, would be a, a, a physical force to, to minimize a, a kind of a, an energy, potential energy or sur, uh, surface tension between the molecules, Laura. And um, many people feel that natural shape, some argue would have been the uh, helping the origin of life as then protein molecules got inside these, uh, these, these natural spheres. And I'll show, I'll show some of the, 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 the uh, single cell biological spheres in a second. Well, when you get to something like a lizard and you have a, a sphere that's going to eat out of one end and now it's useful to move and get your food. And so it becomes a tube, becomes a shape. So we can think of these, we can think of creatures as, by, by thinking, by looking, my claim, <laughs> I'm stumbling a little bit here. My claim is by, let's say, looking at living things and thinking about 
doing a binary in your mind between sphere and what you're seeing, you can, you can start, this is the opening up to thinking about everything. You can start, one can start thinking about what those, what those fingers are doing, what's the tail doing. The, the, the main bulk of the body is, is, is closer to sphere, is closer to being spherical than the fingers are for a reason because it's containing, it's containing uh, a lot of the organs. So one can use the sphere as a doorway into thinking about anything you wanna think about. So first meta pattern, spheres. The affordances, high volume, low surface, strong, as Bucky Fuller knew, building the geodesic domes. And it's also a good symbol of thingness in human thinking. You know, um, we, we often draw diagrams with, with circles and lines between them. Lower left there is a grain, a grain of pollen. I've got the earth. Upper right is the in the picture, in the photo, excuse me, is a um, radiolarian, which is a single-celled um, uh, protist. In the middle, at the background, are soybeans. And at the lower right is one of the first uh, transmission electron micrographs of atoms, first time atoms were ever uh, visualized. Well, I, I'm going to emphasize in, in this talk a lot of the symbolic, psychological, cultural, linguistic aspects of these patterns because they are not just patterns out there in the world. Uh, I got very fascinated at one time by looking at circles and spheres in art and architecture and trying to track down, well, because I was intrigued by the fact that they were so important in sacred uh, sacred architecture, sacred art and architecture. And these, these are various examples of that. They've also come in in the lion there holding the sphere, a, a symbol of power, and that's, that's in Florence, a symbol of royalty. So the sphere has been taken into human symbol systems because of some of its really special properties and the fact that it's omnidirectional, it can be turned in. It can be turned in all directions. Uh, Alberti, the architect, was saying how it's 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 perfect because it's it's in, it's got infinite sides and no sides at the same time, and it's it's got a lot of uh, let's say mystical qualities uh, to it. Very different from the sphere is sheets and tubes. These these this was a, a, this is moving on to the next meta pattern. Um, they have high surface area. They are good for transport, particularly in tubes, to bridge space, to make structures that connect the connect space. Uh, and I show here the Eiffel Tower, a tendril on a grapevine when the grape is trying to find its way up a pole or up another plant. It's not using a sphere to climb, it's using a tube to climb or a, a line, or I, I like the word two because it gives a sort of a three dimensionality to it, but uh, some linear shapes you could call this. And on the right, the lower right there, the picture shows a snake, a rocket and a dolphin, all streamlined in a direction of travel, direction. They're, this is not omnidirectional at all at one moment. This is tr traveling in a direction. A tube is very good for that. Low surface at the front, and yet an elongated body that can help with the travel. Now to go to I, uh, something I'm very fascinated with, the, the use of uh, circles and lines or, sh or shapes and, and lines in human thought structures. Mm -hmm. And what we have on the right there is the uh, Jewish Kabbalah. Mm -hmm. In the middle is a, um, the American Society of uh, Agronomies, sense of their mission, the various things that this society does, that that society does. And on the left there is an Australian Aboriginal dreaming, which have different, has different interpretations. The, the, the circles and lines have different interpretations, but one of them is that it's paths, paths between mythical spots on a landscape, but the landscape is, is real in Australia, but it's also in the mind. 
it, it, it's, it's, it's very, very interesting to me. Uh, and we're all familiar with, with, with this um, idea of, of things being connected by lines. This is, and I, I, I'm, I'm much a proponent of the fact that our thought structures came from nature to a large degree. They, they could be independently discovered to some extent, but the similarity between some of the biological patterns I showed you of spheres and tubes before and, and our thinking structures is to my mind really um, not just remarkable, but worthy of, of a lot of contemplation. Neurologically embedded. You can Neurologically embedded. And uh, one person who's been doing work on the neurological embedding is George Lakoff. He's actually a linguist. I'm going to spend just a couple of minutes on this because it's, it's very, it, this carries over into everything else, all the other patterns. Uh, the field of cognitive linguistics um, talks about um, image schemas and metaphors. And, and when I first saw this book, uh, the um, metaphors we live by on the lower right there, it, it just blew me away because what they claim are some of the most important metaphors in human thinking, there's almost a one-to-one -one correspondence between these meta patterns that I, that I developed at the time, just from look, you know, as I said, I was just in my twenties early on. I, I, I worked these out over decades in teaching at the school of visual arts and, and then uh, graduate school, and then eventually being able to, but it wasn't my PhD program, which was on the global carbon cycle, but I kept working on these you know, kind of in the background as I had other work, but I have to say, they also helped me think. I, I was, I'm convinced they helped me do some of my fundamental thinking. Now, Lakoff's metaphors are, I wanna emphasize, these are not your high school English class metaphors. You know, my love is like a red, red rose. Uh, yeah. But these are something, okay, to use uh, Wordsworth, keep with the poetry there. They are far more deeply interfused. interfused. These are deep in, in the, our thought patterns. So for example, Lakoff says, we, we easily think of ideas as things we connect. We toss around ideas. We follow a line of logic. Oh, we have a we have a train of thought. Those are so easy for us to do. We say, well, thought is thought is thought is there is a train. Well, the claim in cognitive linguistics, and it's in it's in Lakoff's co-author author Mark Johnson. Another book I really like, The Body and the Mind. We think of the mind and the body, the body and the mind that we have developed some of our thinking patterns because they are in our bodies and in the world. Uh, and so this is going to be a theme as I, as I walk through some of these meta patterns. One meta pattern, very important uh, to, in my mind and uh, into actually to general systems theory and people doing work in systems, they call it boundaries. I called it borders. The affordances here is that borders can offer a barrier or to separate inside and outside, which is necessary for living things. You see the, the, the shell of a dragonfly and the chrysalis of a butterfly on the lower right. On the lower left, you see cell walls and on the on the this this oblong shape here is a chloroplast which has a cell which has a cell like membrane around it inside a plant cell so some some separation is necessary that's our human skin but we also know we're only going to live by having pores and openings and bridgings to the environment by exchanging matter and energy with the environment and so a border, not to meaning just the separation, but in a wider sense of including separation and interaction, including barrier and bridges simultaneously, border, some people call it bordering as a process, as a system process, not a mere structure. Humans, we are bordering creatures, you know, just excellent at it, the, 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 and, and sometimes not so excellent. 
I'll, I'll show you a problem, a problem that can happen later when I get to binaries. Game, game courts, tennis, agricultural fields, uh, states, U.S. states, U.S. counties. Um, this is the um, th this is the Chinese uh, forbidden city, the walled city in in uh, Beijing. Uh, when I did mathematical modeling of the global carbon cycle, we would divide the ocean into zones and put fluxes between them. Well, the ocean is not in zones, but it was useful in the mathematical modeling to to divide things up and then you know make make fluxes between them almost like living almost like living things and we know the ocean is one but this allows us allowed me to do certain understanding of the ocean and then there's cognitive borderings so lakoff and johnson again one of i said one their metaphors were almost one to one correspondence with some of my my i don't there there there's not my there, there, other people are thinking this way too as i'm going to show at the end that one of their main metaphors was the container metaphor. And it, we don't mean a, uh, a soup can container. They mean the way we, use, we talk about, are we build in into our words, like enthusiasm, um, educate, to draw out, to, 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 to uh, educt, uh, to uh, draw out of somebody. You, you get into a book, you fall in love, you turn clay into a pot. Turning something into something else is something in time is a is a process in time, and yet we use the word into there, and you and you fall in love. You you get into a book. States of mind, transitions and states of mind can be talked about uh, in that way. And, and in fact, the um, the doctor Dr. Goodman, who uh, you, you guys use, she talks early on in her book about about doorways, about about um, trance states being doorways. Doors and portals. Doors and portals. Okay, binaries. Um, huge pattern. Many people have been thinking about this, including <laughs> the Taoists going back thousands of years, including the alchemists there. I took a, I took a sun and the moon from uh, what, one of the ancient alchemy uh, drawings. And by the way, I love you look at alchemical drawings and they're just full of these basic patterns. I love the drawings and Carl Jung did great analyses of, of alchemical systems uh, and, and, and the patterns. Of course, Jung was searching for archetypes of systems and that, that's uh, the archetypes. That's, that's a, a, a discussion too. But the and red I book super, is full of it. Pardon? But the red book's full of it too. Oh, the red book is full of it. Yeah, where, where, his, where he's right, uh, doing his dreams. And, and I put, I superimposed here electromagnetic, uh, magnetic field lines in this case, but it could be electric field lines. So, so physics is discovering some of these binary systems. And uh, one, of the, uh, one of the suggestions here for using binary, oh, at the top, I forgot to say the affordances, really important. I once spent a full semester at the School of Visual Arts doing a class for art students on binary systems. We just, we focused on that for a whole semester. It's super rich. Uh, bottom line, two is, two is the minimal new. Two gives you the simplest complexity, the simplest relationship, the simplest synergy, the simplest competition. Therefore, when a simple way to make complexity is advantageous, sometimes Tunis is a way to come in. You see what I'm, one, one thing I, you see, I'm doing what I'm doing here, we're, we're not so much now focused on the shapes, like the, like the sphere. This is a shape, but it, it, it can get more abstract. On the, on the, for example, Buddha and both uh, Michelangelo's painting of, of Jesus there, they're both making gestures of going up and down. And, and this is associated well in the case of Christianity hell below and have, uh, separating, separating the, the people into two groups. So, so I, I'm fascinated by the fact that our, our hands, two hands can be used to, to signal up and down mm -hmm. and there can be correspondences between binaries for, and this, is, this can be useful looking at biology. So the plant, the part of the plant that is above that's in the sky, the part of the plant that's below that's in the earth. So the binary plant is related to a, to a division of earth and sky. So we can start having correlations of binaries 
uh, that happening. Some people call these dualisms. Like I'm not really, I'm not, uh, I don't, I don't, I don't have to, we don't have to have the word binary in there. And today, you know, um, of course, but going back used, to biology. So yeah. the hormone system, you yeah. have homeostasis available because you've got two opposing hormones that can interplay. Right. And you've got, yeah. yeah and you've got our eyes, two eyes, a four to three dimensional view. Right. So there's, yeah, great, great example, or great example. By having two eyes, we can get two, we can get uh, sights on two, two aspects of, a, of an object, and we get three dimensionality. And you mentioned the hormone system in, in the brain, there's the, um, uh, 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 I'm thinking genetics here, promoters, but it's the, um, uh, um, you know, ex excitatory neurons and inhibitory neurons, right? So there's an interplay between excitation and inhibition. Which comes Positive, in the Positive negative charges that interplay there too, or yeah, yeah, it could comes there too. Yeah, positive and uh, um, amplifying, amplifying and dampening that's happening in, in systems to give feedback. Or two legs that need each other to move forward. Right? Two legs one's to, resting, one's active, the other, yeah. Yeah, using each other to move forward. Perfect. Yeah. If you're one leg, you're hopping, you're on a pogo stick, uh, it's it's not so great. <laughs> uh, <laughs> The, the two legs lore is an interesting example because that would be a kind of a minimum again. You know, and a lot of four legged animals, uh, six legged animals. This is the point that you, two, just because two is the minimum complexity does not size. mean yeah. it's, it, it, it has to be. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's an opportunity when the minimum is useful. And for humans, for, for the two legged, and I guess maybe the kangaroo um, and the some of the dinosaurs, but the but the the, the humans it, by getting to the minimum for walking, it also free it frees the hands up, so the hands could evolve to to grab tools. So now you have a binary. I'm 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 free associating here, Laura. You have a binary between the feet and the hands. So what we were we were four legged. Now we have hands specialized and feet somewhat specialized. To, to be a binary with, with, with walking, with, with holding things. We can do a lot more with two hands than one, too. Two hands and one. Yeah. Now, binary comes in really important in our human thinking systems, engineering, designing an airplane so the upper surface is more curved than the lower surface, and you have a difference in air pressure and the airplane can lift. You, you, uh, science experiments is using experiments and control. So in case of Louis Pasteur, a flask with broth in it, one, one flask got broken, exposed to the air, one did not. The one that got exposed to the air grew, grew uh, mold in it because it got, might, he proved that there was stuff in the air that could grow. Um, microbes and science is working on, science is very powerfully working on a binary uh, system. At the upper right there, I say we also have to think beyond the binary trinities, quaternaries, the unity of the binary and parallel pairs, which are binaries and more hooked together. And I want to show the somehow these patterns can interconnect with each other. And so in case of, of borders, the border of inside and outside, on that border, you now have a dualism between inside and outside. That dualism in the case of, in the case of like say animal societies can be an in-group and out-group. And then when that gets morphed and, and paralleled into the human mind, we can get concepts such as safe, well, it can either be biological safe and biological dangerous, or it can be human, human language safe and dangerous and somebody wearing a different symbol can be now dangerous and bad we can we can connect good and bad to this so that can be itself you know we have to think this through like that can be very bad obviously um and in a larger sense and so it can be good to go beyond the binary a great book on this by the way is behave by robert sapolsky who takes you all the way from the neuron up into up to uh, the enigmas and problems of in-group out-group uh, um, relationships. But to see the power of the binary, binary zero one, just look at computers too. Is, uh, the computers, yeah, perfect, yeah. perfect example, Laura. Perfect example. Thank you. Uh, centers. 
And Laura, can I ask you the time? I actually can't see it from where I am. Uh, top of the hour. Oh, we're top of the hour. Okay. So I'm going to, um, since we want to, what, hey, Laura, what if I what if I officially went for 10 more minutes? And then we- We, we have no time. We're beyond we no time, time and space here. Yeah, yeah okay. We're just- um, The um, centers offer the, so uh, now that you get the idea, I'm going to go through some of the affordances Centers offer the affordances of um, efficiency of organization in contrast with, with a pattern that I'm going to call distributed. Uh, one of our, uh, our shared heroes here, Bucky Fuller, I took this photo at a lecture I, gave, I, I attended. I gave, yeah, <laughs> I attended. Uh, two of his favorite shapes were the icosahedron on top and the, uh, excuse me, the cubocahedron, on, excuse me, <laughs> the icosahedron on top, which is all triangulated and is stable and the cube octahedron, which is, you have to stabilize it by a central sphere. And Fuller made a big deal about triangulation here. We can, we can make a binary between distributed systems and centered systems. And so for example, um, an ecosystem is very, very distributed. An ecosystem is very distributed but an ant colony with a queen is, can be uh, thought of as reproductively centered, not necessarily for the organization, but reproductively centered in an in a, uh, ant colony of queen, with a queen. So these offer affordances. And I want to say at this, I'll just make an, another point of emphasis. More and more, I am now seeing these meta patterns as gradients and mixes. They're not either ors. So if you take our political system, the, 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 cent, the federal government of the United States is, to, is, is a centralized system, but it's distributed by going down to states, counties, cities, townships. And, and there's a continual debate in the United States between and everywhere in the world between decentralization yeah. and, and centralization. You take it to the concept of God. Which Ouch. I think is brilliant. Yeah. Thanks, Laura. Yeah, you can analyze, one can analyze religions with, you know, are they more centralized in their concept of God or more distributed, like an animistic centri- uh, mm-hmm. concept of God, right, Laura? Yep. Yep. Um, so think of these as, as present, presenting affordances or opportunities for doing mixes of patterns within things within systems. Layers, I can only touch on a few things here. Uh, as Dante and Beatrice at the bottom, we're only you know touching on a few things in the divine Empyrean there. Uh, the affordances of layers, complexity, scale, and richness. And one, all these, there, there's, there's subfamilies of this, just as plants have different uh, kinds of groupings within the angiosperms and gymnosperms, hierarchies and holarchies, holons and clonons, clonons being the advantage of having lots of units that are repeated. So if you're going to make a brick wall, it, it's, it's good to manufacture them and have them all pretty much the same. But if you want to have, let's say, a small group of people get together and talk about something useful, it's good to have them uh, different from each other. So there's different viewpoints there. And down at the bottom, Laura, alphabetic holarchies is the pattern of small numbers of parts of different parts, like the ones and the zeros of the computer language can build up into very, very much uh, uh, complicated layering of, well, the software that we're now using uh, to do this. You would call that combogenesis, wouldn't you? Combogenesis. Uh, a good a good book using some of these I, he didn't use my meta patterns but but these are pat, these are ideas that I, I have to follow and be careful what I say sometimes uh, the, the people many many people have, th- have thought about uh, decentralization and centralization it's a huge huge uh, topic out there Niall Ferguson the square and the tower the square being the public square the tower being sort of the centralized tower and he traces these as two as two waves through history and he, he looks at people who studied the 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 network of the of the medici family the people and the, well you see their networks and power from the freemasons to facebook and he sees these as two i'll use the word meta patterns in this context since that's today's talk meta patterns that are 
interplaying with each other, both with pros and cons, both with pros and cons. You know, you don't want to make the sphere when you need a tube and you don't want, you may need both to make a full plant. Or the circle for the female, the arrow for the male. Yeah. Yeah. Now into time, a little bit into time. Um, patterns in time. How things, what, what, are the, what is the pattern of change? And I have three, arrows, breaks, and cycles. And I'm going to move through them relatively quickly because um, you can get my papers online, so, so the free papers I publish in journals, and we can talk about some of these. But the affordances of what I call arrows here shown a plant development, which are the arrows are gradual changes. So they could be growth, decline, things go up, things go down, development, uh, evolution. Some for there's there's arrows in physical space. It's important for us to move on two feet. It's important for us to, to develop uh, arrows in property space. Often ups and downs are linked to each other in in systems with feedbacks, with, with processes that are causing amplification and processes that are causing dampening. Arrows in and out, the sphere is, um, is, is pumping food, the grape is pumping food into itself as the, as the, as the, as the uh, sphere of the grape is growing. And arrows in possibility space, tree networks formed by, uh, by evolution. This would be our analysis of it this is not something you see. This is something that happens by analyzing time patterns. Like, like the Big Bang, you could call that. Like the Big Bang, like it's, 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 arrow. Yeah. it's one big, yeah, it's one, yeah. When you when, when, when one talks arrow. about the, the big history, the, the big history folks, some of whom uh, are on this, uh, on this Zoom today, um, the idea of big history, uh, not that things can't go backwards, but there's kind of, there's been a sort of an arrow from, um, from, evolutionary from the, arc. the evolutionary arc is, is, is a great term in there too. Thanks, Laura. I'm really enjoying you chiming in there as a voice. I don't see you, but I'm, I'm great to have you, grateful to have you in there. Breaks are, I want to, they're not instantaneous, but they're relatively rapid speeds of change in contrast with more gradual arrows. So they're a meta pattern of contrast uh, they do take time too, except maybe during in the quantum world. I'm not going to try to get into whether that takes time or not. Well, that's out of time. Uh, but three examples here. One is on the right, frog egg to tadpole to frog. Three arrows, and they have breaks between them in the, in the frog's development. There are transition zones. On the left is are three uh, stages in the, in the 10 ox herding pictures of Zen Buddhism. Uh, in which you, in which toward enlightenment up there, um, and actually at the, at the circle, <laughs> the, the Zen, the, I didn't mention the Zen Enso uh, as one of the supreme uh, examples of enlightenment in Zen. Uh, in, in the, I, but I'll mention it now, I just mentioned it. And in the middle there, Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous. Now one cannot, uh, and we now know that there are mass extinctions at, between those time periods and the mass extinction did take time, but in the case of the, uh, well, uh, uh, tri Triassic, um, the Permo-Triassic at the bottom there, but the Triassic-Jurassic changed the nature of some of the dinosaurs that, that, uh, that went in there. But the, to go into the Triassic was the permanent one, Permian, one of the big mass extinctions and going out of the Triassic what, to go into the tertiary was, um, uh, excuse me, not out of the Triassic, to go out of the Cretaceous into the tertiary, it was not shown there as one of the big mass extinctions. So we know that there was uh, changes going on, but one, one cannot argue meaning there, except uh, occasionally we get pulverized from space and, uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and life has to, uh, life work itself out. But, but in the mind, in the conceptualizations in the left and in human bi in biology, there can be functional reasons for having times of quick transitions, such as in punctuated the Punctuated equilibrium. Yeah, it's punctuated. Evolution. It's just like a developmental punctuated equilibrium. Um, and you could apply that not just to, well, you're, um, yeah. You're, al you're also helping me understand the monotone beat where it's action, pause, action, pause, action, yeah. pause. Oh, okay. And okay. that's very significant too. Okay, action, pause, action, pause. Yeah, yep. a monotone beat. Right or a swing, yeah. 
Yeah. It, it, it's useful to our work. You will understand why later, but go ahead. And and transformation of the psyche. I, I, I told you some of my moments of, of what they at the time were revelations to me that started me off on some of these paths. Uh, here at, at the bottom is the, the lizard of alchemy as a symbol of uh, transmutation or trans, uh, 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 transition. And at the top is a picture um, from Gregory Bateson's photographs of studying trance and dance in Bali of this little girl. And when I had Bateson, this a lecturer, he showed us movies of these girls going into trances. And I know, Laura and Paul, you're very much um, into this work. Cycles will be my last meta pattern before I uh, do some uh, call outs to some systems thinkers. Put together arrows in, in breaks. So you can make helices. helixes. The, the affordance of the cycle is change and return. Well, well, what's that change and return? There can be advantages to going out of your home to the grocery store. <laughs> this is really a simple example getting food and coming back or an animal going somewhere to get food and coming back to home base there can be um, advantages to to do more abstract change in return to um to go to sleep and wake up e even though you maybe haven't moved very much well, what about there, life death and rebirth um logically biologically Biologically, the stars also have that pattern. cycle of life. Stars, Laura, yes, yeah, stars, the, the disintegration of stars or the explosion of some into supernovas and the re-coagulation of that material back into new stars. And as that happens, the carbon level in the universe is building up um, uh, because as the carbon is formed in fusion. And then so the planets are, are presumably getting more and more carbon on them. So there, there could be an arrow. Well, they, they call it the arrow of metal, 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 I haven't said this word, I've seen it, metal, metallicity or something like that. It's everything except hydrogen. So these higher elements are formed as an arrow over time through the cycles of stars. Very cool uh, example. Making life and us possible. Making, making life possible. So cycles powering arrows and music of the cycle, cycles in, in um, I, I fantasize Laura as I, after I, did this uh, PowerPoint, I fantasize changing everything and just doing a guided meditation on levels of cycles or something like that. But, <laughs> oh, you're invited. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Make that a special event. Yeah. Uh, so there's different, uh, and there's a relationship between the meta patterns and the cycle. So tubes, things can go back and forth from, from spheres to uh, in relationship. Low, the, the middle left there, cycles within uh, a, cent a, a system, like a cell with a centralized nucleus and the metabolism. So in the middle, binary, back and forth, the minimum relationship is a cycle. Middle, upper, um, cycles, a, a, a complete cycle within uh, the turning of, a, let's say, a metabolism or, or a society or something like that. All right, the meta patterns. I'm going to sum up and then do some call outs to people. Um, on the upper right there, so you got the meta patterns. I put them back, not into names anymore, but just as the symbols. Uh -huh. uh, upper right is um, Blake's drawing of Isaac Newton. And this is one aspect of meta patterns. I see them useful as analyzing and designing. And by, by analyzing, it's not, it's not the mathematical analysis Although you know one can anal one can say there's a topology. I sometimes think of these as topological, but it's not the it's not what you when you look up the, the math of topology. It's it's not that, but it's sort of the it's sort of the science of shape and form and function, I guess. But on the upper right is this more mystical aspect of the of the meta patterns is that one can take one of these patterns and just walk down the street and start looking at things. And, and looking at and ask and just looking for that pattern as a way to connect things. And I, I will suggest one, you can really put yourself into a very um, interesting positive state of mind by doing this. Yeah. At, at least I at least I have found it to be so. <laughs> so some call outs, quick, very quick call outs. Some of these slides I want to say, I'm not intending that you read everything on them. 
just to a little bit of a warning, but I just, since you're recording this and posting it later, I just want to be complete. So where I got photos from and things like that, Carolyn uh, Levine's book again on forms, whole rhythm, hierarchy and network. You now see there's almost a one-to-one -one correspondence, rhythm being cycles, whole being my sphere. She actually brings in boundaries there, boundedness, hierarchy being the the layers network being another form of layers and she also talks about oppositional binaries in social political structures and in literature so all the meta patterns are there uh, this is peter stoiko who's in the isss the international society of systems uh, science uh, he's a designer uh, doing doing work with he calls a, a, a vi uh, system visualization making uh, thinking well you see there nesting, centrality, container, levels of scale, feedback, and bridge. I just picked out a few of his. You can look him up on the website if you're interested. He's doing fantastic work. And he's starting to do work with making these in motion. Um, um, Helen, uh, Helen Finadori, I believe she's on this, uh, on this Zoom. Uh, she also ISSS member doing work in pattern literacy uh, in pattern languages, looking at different kinds of pattern languages from, from uh, uh, indigenous African people to uh, architects such as Christopher Alexander and very aware of Bateson's work um, also. Uh, here's Christopher Alexander, who's come up several times. He has these, uh, these he developed these, uh, he, he died recently, he developed these uh, 15 properties of living structures and as Leitner describes in his book, the English word living does not encompass what the, uh, the German word for this could be. I think it's Lebendig. And because Leitner says you can use the word Lebendig for a, a concert that you went to. And Alexander was using the word living to, in this very expansive way, both for nature and for culture. But look there, strong center, boundaries, gradients, yeah, yeah. binary alternating repetition, that's, that's cycles. Uh, he's got the yin yang symbol there, positive space in, in and out. It's, it's, it's all there, we're, we're all in the same, we're all kind of on the same you know, wavelengths here. Len Troncali, former president of the IFSS, um, he's do, been doing work, a lot of work, incredible work on iso, he uses Von, von Bertalanffy's term, isomorphisms. Uh, here's just one of his things on cycles, and you see he's developing the, the sub-cycles of, of the phenomenon of cycles. Len did this, I, we just sort of um, discovered each other recently in the last couple of years as some people from the IFSS um, got a hold of me and we've been having, uh, well, anyway, this was in the, totally independent work, and yet there's some strong correspondences, which makes me think there's some there's, there is, uh, uh, there's some objective reality to, uh, to, to this. Oh, Barbara uh, Whithall, um, uh, PhD work on community learning structures and systems uh, using principles by uh, Fritz Hoff Capra and the Center of Equal Literacy, but applying those to community learning. Look at this, cycles, flows, which are arrows, development and the arrow, the arrow of property space dynamic balance, <laughs> binary forming a synergy, uh, and network, uh, you know, so, sort of inside and outside with, 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 with boundedness. George Mobis, current president of the IFSS, um, one, one of his books, Principles of System Science. Here's one of his diagrams to, to do thinking in systems. What's your boundary? What's your system of interest? Hmm. It, it's, it's open to you. What's your, and what's your inputs and the outputs? It's your system of interest to do interesting thinking about it. Uh, Jesse uh, Henshaw, I think she's on the Zoom today, uh, doing a lot of work with, um, with, with on the upper left there, uh, universal uh, development patterns or universal growth patterns with the, what I would interpret it as an arrow of, of upswing and, and then a transition point and an arrow of leveling off in which there's breaks at the bottom, she calls it germ, and then a fulfilling of autonomy. She's been using this in everything from analyzing biology to how you build a building to thinking about sustainability in the, in the future. 
wow. lower left there centers with with boundary zones this is abstract it's not necessarily around a house but this is one example of how you can think about it same language completely independent from what i what i did i did not know her when i was doing this work uh jeff bloom a colleague of mine we've written some papers together he he put together the meta patterns uh, wiki dot website uh, he's a science educator a former professor educating people to be educators uh, and he's been doing work with, um, he's now uh, with the, Basin, the, the uh, Gregory Bateson Institute, International Bateson Institute, but he used, did some work using meta patterns to analyze children's thought structures, un, unguided, unguided by the teacher or minimal guide as they're thinking about density, as they're, as they're <sighs> thinking about the problem of density and and the thought system that they're going through, he put into meta patterns as a patterns language to analyze the, the uh, children's um, social dynamics and, and they're not just their social dynamics, but their thinking patterns as they argued, as they came to agreements, cycles, breaks, etc. Hmm. Just a couple more. Um, Gabriel Rico, um, wrote a book called Writing the Natural Way and Using the Right Brain to Help You Write. And there's a, 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 another mind blower for me. These are all diagramming techniques. Uh, and they were there was very close correspondence uh, to, uh, to the meta patterns of, of her thinking about rhythm, of her thinking about central ideas and peripheral ideas as to using centers. And finally, the Student Journal of Meta Patterns. Uh, when I when I occasionally had the opportunity to run this as a course at NYU, it often did not fit into ordinary departmental categories. Uh -huh. But there were so, sometimes I there were opportunities at NYU to to run these as special seminars, uh, and this was the last time I ran it in uh, 2020. And uh, this is uh, actually Jeff Bloom put together the graphic on the left in which uh, these are figures from every student's paper had one figure in this, but we used meta patterns to think about the human future. Undergraduate students, very concerned about human future, especially environmental study students. Uh, and they were using, and there you can see, you can just scan through titles and then uh, the meta patterns that were focused on after they went through the entire group of meta patterns did small projects on all of them. So they kind of worked up their muscles, their meta patterns muscles, and then took a topic on a personal interest to them that they used meta patterns to expand the, um, on, and, and go with, with, with How fun. research. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Um, so one question to, to the group, uh, I'll throw out, of course, I, I'm, I'm going to field anything and everything and, and listen to controversy, pushback, uh, you know, but one question I have that I'm interested in for all of you is what do you think it means that all these people are, uh, you know, kind of doing similar work with a some, somewhat similar, with somewhat similar approach? And I say non-mathematical, that's something I haven't touched upon, the relationship between this and the, the mathematical work going on in network theory and complexity theory. Uh, but, but to some, some extent, this is, this is looking at stuff that you could not necessarily mathematize immediately, but still usefully see patterns in there. So if there are varieties between the people I showed you, of course, and viva la difference, and I think I'll stop the show and we can uh, well, go back. Well, first of all, I love your image there. I want a poster of that. Yeah. OK. Yeah. So um, yeah, brilliant. You know, it's, uh, it's so interesting that so many people are using it as a roadmap into their field to, to um, cite these comparisons, to draw these comparisons, to gain these insights. And I was just thinking how in anthropology and art, as you mentioned, sociology, the design traits, so much more. This should be a textbook, right? This should be foundational um, understanding for us, symbology, uh, art history, uh, all of it applies across the board. And I want to give my own shout out. So if you want to stop your slide, yep. I want to give a shout out. And this comes straight from your book. 
Okay. Okay. Oh, uh, wait. I'm just finding my arrow. Thank you right for that. Here. That was just um, yeah. bedazzling. Just having yeah. trouble. With... Okay. Hang on. Maybe I just do return. Whoops. Uh, at the top of the uh, Zoom screen. Yeah. You got my my um my arrow is uh, sorry. My arrow is just okay. Oh yeah, I think I might have the chance to. Yeah, yeah, yeah there. there you okay. go. Perfect. Well, I want to give a shout out to our planet, Mother Earth, <laughs> as a sphere. And as you cite in your book, this is the biosphere, the atmosphere, the hydrosphere, the lithosphere, the technosphere, and hopefully the emerging noosphere. And so here we are, this container, this playground that we're in. What are we doing with it? How are we protecting it? How are we um, honoring it? How are we celebrating it? How are we protecting it? So I think, indeed, um, it's just a, a miracle of life. And for us to understand this in this depth, thank you. Thank you for the, the tour through nature's palette. It's the power to, of your the power of your shout outs, being able to be that inclusive and making sure that all the different bases are, are being included in the work. It and all the people playing in this Coming field back to that con conversation we had with, uh, yeah. with uh, Bill Halal on the global consciousness uh, concept that you know it's time for the world of science and all human humanity in general to come together to share what we know and what we don't know. And let's recognize that our ancient ancestors were also playing with these symbols and their yeah. art and their understanding yeah. <clears throat> and their sure yeah so um, that this deeply is embedded in us. Of course, we create with this because we're made of this, mm -hmm. right? We can only, it's self-referential. We can only uh, use and know what we already have and own. Mm. So I think, yeah. I think that's All such right. a key. The power of the, power of the, the imagery, the power of symbol, it just continues to. Yeah, and to see it. Yeah, in yeah so these could be levels. tools just for, for, for thinking about things and also tools for, again, designing our minds, designing our societies, designing our, our lives. Yeah, so you, you just brought that up really well that that the yeah. symbols are not just outside but they're they're living um in us and yeah. and we can get into that um yeah. more in depth but you have a lot of folks here that are from the ISSS let's start with them okay. we should start there okay well Dan is the first hand up so let's let's ask, add Dan to the discussion hello Dan yeah, turn on your mic yeah. oh, I was muted sorry yeah um, Hello and welcome. Thank you. Um, I'm a sculptor, and I did something. I this whole this whole discussion relates to this big public artwork piece that I did, um, and I, uh, I I did it for a pioneer uh, uh, a precinct police building. But Paul, I can put into the chat here. I think. Okay. So what what I my interest was is I was looking at the Mayan calendar. So. Yeah. If you have your, your little Mayan calendar there with the guy sticking his tongue out, that center circle, um, that center circle makes... It's like a tube in a sphere to me, but go ahead. Yeah. yeah, it makes this form and those five little circles there, I found are really important because they relate to uh, Venus. And Venus makes five points in the sky at its little apex of where it moves. So the fifth of a circle is the is 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 uh, the golden section essentially as a circle, um, and that's why you have the Fibonacci sequence with flowers and the designs of pine cones and how everything opens symmetrically. So I was like, well, that's pretty interesting. So I went and mapped those little dots. This is kind of hard to see, but I mapped all those little dots as the center points of oh, uh, I see. of circles. Um, and those circles had a little bit of fat dimension to them, but they all intersect, if you look in the center, in this big fractal pattern. Hmm. And that's a mandala pattern that shows up across cultures. And yeah. I was putting this into an area where there's like 200 different cultures. And my idea was that you have all these, all these uh, patterns in nature and through mathematics, like with Pythagoras, where he had his little group of enthusiasts, you know, and they were showing how that can, that can uh, define action in society. So this is for a police precinct moving into this area of minorities. And my idea was to try to have something around these officers all the time where whether they realize it or not, right. they're mm -hmm. being motivated to do 
the right thing, you know, where there's like some law there. And then there's the idea of this outside circle that goes around it, which had to do a lot with some of the things you were talking about, bounding it. And you also notice that there's the five circles, there's there's an open pattern at the top where the energy can move. Um, like a labyrinth. So let me so, so let me see. You're you're taking like the 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 uh, native uh, piece, and then right. you're abstracting it, and different. You're doing different things with it. Exactly. Cool. So so I get from there. I can derive all the circles out of that pattern. Oh wow! And just have it formulate nice. circles, and then have it yeah. be circles. And so these are like you know your circle, square, and triangle, the universal building blocks of formal language. <laughs> There's all the triangles. Yeah. <laughs> nice. All the squares. Wow! Wow! And okay. Can can, can, you can, you can you put in the chat? Can you put in the chat away? People could modern. look up your your work somewhere. Uh, yeah. Or, or, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thanks for giving us That's that. Beautiful. That I, those, yeah. that, you know, I really think there work. is some I think, power to I think it's really cool. Yeah. power to symbol and that just by observing yeah. a symbol i'm really yeah. uh interested yeah. in knowing how that impacts us on yeah. some deep level beyond words and oh. uh beyond the written and spoken word and that it yeah and rick it is, must I mean, rick is taking, us on yeah, some deep deep level off. because yeah. we recognize this i also want to mention um cheryl Sherilyn morrow a member of our community and astronomer uh, we're looking at uh venus as and the venus goddesses and how venus with its relationship between the sun and earth does have those five points. It is a symbol from ancient times in terms of how we spot her. She's an evening and a morning star, depending on her cycle and right. the sun and the earth and that rotation. It gets very um, interesting because and one, symbolic. One more, one more thing mythical. you might like to see. I, uh, I, I was really, I really loved the Southwest um, traveling to the Utah desert a lot when I was younger. Um, and the idea of, um, those ancient sites and the hieroglyphs and the relationships with nature. Um, so I did this as a class assignment when I was in my 20s, but I'll kind of scroll it down. And so here we have uh, the pot, and the pot reflects the landscape. Ah. And then the landscape goes up into the into the heavens, and then it's reflected in the clouds, and then mm. it's reflected in the stars, and then you have your celestial idea of it there. Very cool. Wow. Um, you're cool, helping man. us decode this. Yeah. Um, cool. Okay. Yeah, so next is uh, Brian, I, I guess. Yeah, uh, Brian Tucker. Yeah. Hi, Brian. Yeah, great. Great. Hello, everybody. Tyler, wonderful to hear your presentation. I've been so looking forward to this. And uh, after encountering meta patterns many years ago, what occurs to me to want to find out more from you is how, how you've learned to embody these patterns. If they end up kind of informing you, Certainly they have embodied you in your creativity and your intellect and such, but have you found like going into deep meditation and, and really accessing, it's so evident in your work that there's an interiority coming through, as Laura called it, that mythopoetic language is emerging, but how, how might we take these patterns and begin to embody them in a way that they bring about this kind of similar process of discovery and insight? I'm interested in how the meta patterns awaken the intuition. So when, as you are studying disparate fields, you can quickly intuit the connections and um, and the similarities as well. How have you learned to embody these uh, meta patterns, and how have they become almost friends in your life? Thank you. Brian. Oh, beautiful question, Brian. Thank you, Brian. Brian, yeah, thank you for that. I I, I don't think I can say more than I I've, I've indicated, just because um, I mean I said one ha one has to in a way be friends with them, live with them to some extent. It's not something I can just say in a sentence or two, but um, by seeing the examples and then, you know, as I suggested at the end, it taking a walk with uh, maybe taking borders or I, what, what I would suggest, you, you take one. You, you, you take one and go to an art museum with that in mind. And maybe not take them all, but go to an art museum. Um, I mean, Jeff Blue and I did this with a class once in Flagstaff. We went to the uh, and looked at the indigenous art uh, through that viewpoint. So I, I might say the, the best thing is to take one and to uh, use that as your meditation for a while, for for that time. Well, yeah, also hang the symbols around you. Look at what you have in the background. I know that's direct from nature. That's a molecule, but it looks so similar to Dan's art. 
Mm-hmm. And I, as I say, art, I mean, nature is my, is our favorite artist. Yeah. And look at everything around us is her art and, um, and dance with them. Yeah. I say that. Is that good them. enough for now? Yeah. For now, yeah. Thank you very much. I'll ask Thank more you. later. Thank you, Brian. Uh, Jesse is up next. Hello, yeah. Jesse. Yeah, hi. Um, yeah, what I've been doing with, with uh, these kinds of patterns uh, uh, that seem to pop up almost everywhere is uh, use them because nature is actually a little bit more complex than the patterns we think of. The patterns we think of are quite simple. Um, but we see something that's sort of like them, you know, like circles and spheres, although there are no circles and spheres in nature, um, specifically, you know, not mathematical ones, not perfect uh, ones. except in our theories. So uh, instead of following my theory, I'm, I'm comparing my theory to the form I think it's like in nature to help me examine what's different about nature. So a, a, a way to do a, a, a deep observational dive into into the into the actual forms that uh, are expressing this pattern, and and of course one of those is is growth. That's part of part of everything. That everything begins with this uh, ex- explosion of innovation, which is what growth begins with. Uh, a, a seed germinates and then it explodes with creating this new form, and then this long process of maturing it, uh, which is the first the uh, the uh, acceleration and then deceleration. That, but the important thing about the deceleration, I find, is that it's the perfection of the form. It's our maturation. It's our education. It's our learning uh, what to do with it. And so it's a it's something that's very much embedded in all the stages of of life and effort that, that we make. Uh, and uh, so it gives you a chance to get absorbed in those. Yep. Beautiful. Thank yep. you, Jesse. Yep. For very nice. Yeah. 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 I had to say, what, what I had to wear a meta pattern to today. So I chose one of nature's. I'm going yeah. to celebrate nature in that. Yeah. But I thought, okay, the sphere and the center that you talk about, two meta patterns, but nature has those um, non-omnidirectional forces that uh, play at it. And that's what makes it so interesting and beautiful, yeah. right? Is, yeah. yeah. Plato yeah. may have danced with the perfect forms, but nature dances with it in play. Yeah. Yes. Thank you, Jesse, and yeah. it was nice to... Jesse, uh, thank your, your contributions. I know you do a lot of research into the, the uh, natural patterns of... Uh, of, of uh, the patterns. The patterns itself, right, exactly. Yeah. So it's a, pr- it's a pleasure to have you here as well. Thank you for joining us for this conversation. Stay in touch. <laughs> Okay. All right. All right. And then we're going to go to Jean next. Uh, I think Jean is or is it Jean. I don't know. Oh, Jean. Okay. It's Jean. <laughs> it's Jean. Yeah. Hi, Jean. Yeah. We have some Jeans that come too. Hi. And welcome. I am so thrilled to be here. Tucker and I have danced around in the same neighborhood for almost the same years, have the same inspiration, Gregory Bateson. And Tucker. Tyler. (laughs) Tyler, I just really want to congratulate you. Yeah. As far as my own limited experience, you have touched on the central problem today. And we can all come up with many, many examples which I think are extraordinary. And it could be an encyclopedia. But for me, the point is, you are dealing with the problem of paradox. And you are saying all things are one way unless another thing happens. A sphere acted on by a biological force. That's just an example. Every single thing everyone is mentioning our paradoxes and our modern rational way of thinking doesn't stop at paradox it does not entertain that and that's the big leap that brian tucker brought out 
by saying, how do we embody this? And of course, that is also a huge difference today. Both uh, Tyler and I have taught architects in schools of design hmm. and dealt with this problem. If, you know, what, what's going on inside of here? I have no idea. Where's, where's my stomach? Where's my toe? We are so separated from our bodies. So this question of how do you embody the very part of where our thinking stops, which is at paradox. And I just know this is so brief and so based on what I grabbed from what he was saying, but you reached the place that in my own thinking has been central. Are our thought structures coming from nature or are we imposing them? Oh, that's a really interesting question, Tyler. Yeah, it just, I just want to, I just really want to mm -hmm. um, yep. emphasize yep. how extraordinary this group is because everybody can contribute to, with examples, but he brought us to the doorway and the doorway is in your own body mm. and being embodied. And then suddenly, yeah. paradox is the doorway. A good so, point. Interesting. I, interesting. I really, yeah, thank you. Position. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you, Jean. So. Tyler, can you say something to that? I, that was a fantastic comment. I mean, yeah. I, I think Jean is seeing paradoxes being brought into the 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 manifestation of 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 things of systems of living stuff of whatever word entities beings right, right. i guess gene beings um so yeah you know thanks thanks for that it's it does it grow from within us or are we imposing it oh in terms of a question yeah uh well i think it, it's right so that's a paradox too it's a dance it's, isn't it yeah, but I think the big revelation there, Gene, is, is I think you're, what you're saying, and I agree with, the big revelation is that a lot or a significant portion of our thinking is, is coming from the patterns that we evolve with, both biologically and going back into human evolution and uh, developmentally. Uh, that, so, so whether you can claim what, what I'm not going to certainly claim all our thinking is that because we have to allow some for latitude for evolutionary innovation. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, the the big the big the big uh, message there is that uh, it's worth thinking about how much our thinking is is mirroring and using in a new way uh, the these basic these basic abstract patterns, which abstract, they are not abstract and not existing. They exist in some kind of abstract space of affordance, but they keep on getting found by the beings that are manifesting form. I appreciate I, I, what you're saying that we're continually I, evolving. And so like my dad used to say, if you don't grow, you die. Right. And so nature is always, what the universe is expanding. Maybe that's a metaphor. The fact that the sea potentiality is continuing to expand and unfold on itself and create these new spheres of combogenesis and uh and it's it's yeah uh, evolution yeah. yeah i just one comment okay. to tyler and you use the word mirror i would say there is no gap that's the problem you where you have gone is not a mirror and when I look at you, I have to think, oh, my right arm is on his left side. That doesn't apply in the realm that you're discussing. And it has no gap. Okay, I don't quite understand that. But I know, I know. Um, but, I but we have a lot of other yeah. questions and comments. That, yeah. yeah. But it is interesting, the, the symmetry. The symmetry. It is interesting, our symmetry. Mm -hmm. And what's also interesting is I, what I like is that we can find our way in space no matter where we are, yeah. being symmetrical beings, forward, behind us, to the left, to the right, above, below. That's we can right. orient ourselves right. in space. Mm -hmm. So 
Uh, yeah. yeah, interesting. Good points, Jean. Yeah. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. Gave us a lot Thank to ponder you. on. And Thank Barbara's you. up next. So we're going to go to Barbara right here and add and turn on your mic. Hello, Barbara, and welcome. Hi, Barbara. Hi. Thank you so much, and thank you, Tyler. That was such a treat. And thank you also for giving me a, a shout out. Uh, in addition to uh, Fridge of Copper, you were one of my uh, people without knowing you who inspired me, and especially that notion of patterns being transferable across contexts. That really shaped my whole doctoral work and how I've been seeing the world since then. And so um, you said, you know, how come we're all working on this? at the same time and, and, and what does that mean? I think for me, I've really noticed an evolution since I did my doctoral work about 10 or 12 years ago, um, that for me, uh, these patterns have become a values discernment tool. They've become much more so, I mean, they were before then too, um, but I can really sense now that they've become an anchor for me. They've become a, a compass how I make choices. And so, um, and it's, it, as several of you have mentioned, it's an embodied, it's become an embodied way of, um, of living for me. So, you know, since I uh, did my doctoral work, I also became a dance instructor. And now I, I did this dance modality called Bioranza, which is actually founded or grounded in the patterns of nature. And uh, when I teach, now, um, it is very clear to me that I can, these patterns come to me and, and I emanate them because I can feel them, I sense them, I can analyze them, uh, I dance them, and, uh, and that's how a day can guide me as a values discernment tool. And so I'm, st I'm just so tremendously grateful for that because it also allows me and has allowed me lately to communicate about things that are very controversial. Okay. In, in, a, in a kind of taking the blame out of the game kind of way because I can frame them in the context of nature's patterns. Wow. So thank you so much. And I, I'm just curious how that it's for you. Like for me, this is kind of my value tool now. And I'm wondering what 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 that's like for you, Tyler. Ah, Barbara. Nice. Yes, but I had I had that's I I thank you for that language. I I, I love it. I um, you know, I, you know, we're doing different work somewhat. You're you're maybe a little bit more of the social sciences, would I say? And I'm coming out of the natural sciences, but for our PhDs. But um, yeah, I'm 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 with you all on, on that. Uh, the values, definitely. I think Thanks, it's so Barbara. valuable to understand ourself, our society, the challenges ahead in the context of the natural world and those dynamic forces, the evolutionary biological imperatives and the whole of it. That's how one tool that I don't think is being utilized enough to help us unravel um, the challenges and the framework that we're placing them in. So I think that's so valuable, uh, Barbara. Please drop us a line. We'd like to know more about your work. Sure. Yeah, yeah. and it's a pleasure to meet you. Thank you. You're yeah, such a bright being. <laughs> so yeah. is next. Yeah. Hi. Hello and welcome. Hi. Hi. Uh, first and foremost, I mean, I, I would not have known about this group uh, had Tyler not invited me. Um, Tyler, uh, I've had this book for, I don't know, 20 plus years, I guess. <laughs> and uh, just to tell you how much I love the book is an indicator of how much I've written in it. <laughs> the marginalia <laughs> always that's is. That's usually an indicator yeah. of how, how much uh, a book has impressed me or liked. Uh, uh, I will admit that I did not read it for many years and only recently did I really like tear it apart. Um, and so to give you a little background, I have been teaching design students for the last several years. years. Uh, I was a systems architect, you know, um, I wanted to be an architect, but I couldn't, so I became a systems architect. So I've always thought in terms of, you know, drawings and patterns and stuff like that. So then, and then another book that I would like to, like, recently um, mm. uh, triggered because um, it, it also does a lot of this kind of stuff. Yep, don't, I don't know that book. Cool. 
And oh. so what happened was because I was drawing so much in my journals, which is my daily practice, somebody said, why don't you look at this book? And then I came back to your book. Anyway, that's my, um, that's my, uh, journey. so I wanted to kind of re uh, thank you for, uh, en uh, you know, en uh, engaging with me and then wow. inviting me to this. How do you use this in design? What is the key insight for you to apply these meta patterns in your design work? So basically when you're looking at uh, my, my practice is mostly social transformation and innovation. Oh. I think you're looking for um, building blocks. You know, you, you're dealing with complexity and you don't really know how to handle that complexity mm. and yeah. you don't want to reduce it yet at the same time, you need some way. I'm also a trained futurist and you're looking at spaces that are evolving and spaces that are not yet there. And you need to like, you know, using a language that somebody else used, cutting cubes out of fog, right? And trying <laughs> to like figure out uh, yeah, how, to, how to create some kind of a, a building block that explains, that is an explanation. So I loved today's talk. I um, particularly like the idea of affordances. I had not thought about these in terms of affordances mm -hmm. and they're going to be very useful. I'll just, um, I don't want to take too much time. I just want to like, um, uh, ask you to maybe comment now or later. I've been trying to figure out if the COVID crisis can be understood in terms of patterns. And I've been thinking in terms of proximity of things and then things like moving apart and centrifugal and centrifugal, uh, you know, people forces of ways that society comes together and the need to be, you know, close together versus, you know, uh, what happens in a crisis when the thing starts, you know, going apart and then starts coming back together, uh, things like that. So I am finding utility. I mean, you know, this, this has been a wonderful thing. Thank you for inviting. And um, uh, I hopefully we'll have other conversations. Please drop uh, us a line and stay in touch. Yeah. Yeah. Every one of you stay lovely. in touch because yeah. we, we, we're going to be having more and more roundtable discussions and continuing the search and, and journey. And of course, Tyler has been so generous with us. We've interviewed you to Tyler, I think, well, we don't want to say too too long back because no, it makes no, no, no. But like 1990s, and we've interviewed him three or four times in the radio show days, and then of course we did him last month, and now now this discussion is so broad and so powerful and so yeah. necessary to have. So I'm really excited. You know, I want to say that um, waves, yeah. have you looked at waves and patterns with waves? Because another pattern that's really interesting, I'm curious where you would put this, what cymatics and oh, right. um, the making the invisible visible as in terms of patterns and waves and the mandalic patterns and all that. But one of the key insights that might address um, Sudhir's uh, comments is that when you see cymatics, the patterns based on a tone, right, that's made visible by very spherical um, dust right. on a membrane, the, it, it uh, falls into the, falls out of the active zones of the pattern and finds where it's more restful, so a pattern's created. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and they mm -hmm. say that when tones are changed, chaos ensues. Everything is in action, they, the spheres all bounce around, and then they settle into the new pattern. So you have these periods of chaos between social order, you could say. And so a lot has been said about, you know, huh, we're moving rapidly from one age into the next, one, uh, order into the next it's accelerated so there's periods of chaos and then what what is wants to emerge what, what is the new pattern how do we create those new patterns so um how do we participate yeah, yeah. yeah. how do we <laughs> manage through it yeah. um well we're, yeah so we're going to we we as the global society are going to be thinking about borders, binaries. I mean, we're going to be thinking Thank about you. some of these issues. Um, Can we apply this to understanding yeah. where we are today? I thought that was a key insight, Sudhir. Thank you yeah. for that. And how can we help manage our way through it and find hope that we'll settle out into a, a newer, uh, more coherent pattern? Who's next? Helene is coming up next. Here we are. Yes. Oh, Helene. Yes. So, well, Thank thanks, you. Tyler. It was a, a good uh, wake-up call to start joining conversations again. Am I, do you hear yes. me? Yes, uh, yes, yes. yes. Um, I, I met Tyler in a, in a small group conversation that was going on uh, almost every Saturday, wasn't it? And then it went every month. 
And then it started to stop a little bit. I don't know if you started again. And I was fascinated not only by Tyler's uh, meta patterns and combo genesis, but by his alpha kits, because I'm looking at patterns from a language perspective and trying to show how patterns are involved in our cognition and in the way we model our environments and act in our environments and how the patterns and the modeling processes that occur in our operating in our environments are those that are also constitutive to our social um, systems and our communi communication systems and our sign systems. And I strongly believe that language as a sign system that mainly focuses on itself, which are the words, which words am I going to best use and what's my ontology and what's my uh, uh, syntax, etc., cetera, uh, is, is maybe not the best tool to be able to understand each other across all kinds of boundaries. Uh, because if we look at it from a biosemiotic perspective, even the, the, the uh, all, I mean, there are theories that say that uh, um, evolution and evolution in consciousness uh, was sign based uh, hmm. and reaching a, a greater complexity through evolution in, 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 in species and that we humans are not different from that and that we have a, an embedded and embodied sign system that I like to call patterning that is different and it is underpinning the languaging capability which is more rhetoric and discourse based. So wow. uh, yeah, my line of work is to try and get a theory on that, that people can base tools and methods upon to better use patterns as literacy, uh, as a means for literacy to better understand each other, our systems and all kinds of things that, that happen in, in the world. And I'll stop here. And unfortunately, I'll have to leave quite soon because it's, it's late in France, uh, but uh, I hope uh, I'll be able to hear what's going on later in the, in the conversation on the video. Well, well Helen, th thank you for that. Yeah, that, that's really, uh, I, I, I agree with the, all, all of that, what you, what you said, that that would be what would be a search. So what's your current take on the, on the fact of these different pattern languages that, as I said, are somewhat similar, but then have differences? Um, uh, how do you think of, you've been thinking about this for quite a while, pattern languages plural yes because actually because we each evolve and co-individuate in our own domains of of operation uh, we we develop our, our our languages or our way of modeling even if they're pattern based in different ways so i started my work by doing lots of little icons and I have lots also that that resemble yours or or Barbara's or some of the examples that you put up on the on the screen so that and must I mean was, that must mean something right that, uh, that, that yes must... well I my, my main question was can you get a finite set and that's where the alpha kit is interesting is can you get a finite set of patterns or do you need to base yourself on comparison and develop ways of getting people to, con to compare the pattern representations that they have that underpin their different ways of modeling and languages? Oh, and I'm I now, see what you're saying. Oh, that's really interesting. And, and I'm can... now more into, well, whatever the representation or whatever the sets or whatever the the the, the patterns basically the, the the interesting bit is in the process of 
discussing, yes, using language or using drawings or using all kinds of things to go beyond. And there's a last thing I wanted to say is that Laurie, is it Laurie or Laura? Laura. Laura. I answered it both. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you, you talk a lot about symbols and in semiotics or in biosemiotics or in Persian semiotics, let's say the symbol is a convention, which is a social, social construction, which is more about language and languaging than it oh, yeah. is about patterning. So that's another way of putting different meanings into, into oh. terms. Oh, I'd love and to so, talk with you more about languages. Go ahead. I, yeah. And so, and so, uh, and so, I was surprised because I'm trying to say sometimes I want to get out of the symbolic system that we have because a symbol is something that is necessarily shared and learned together that you acquire by learning together in a practice or in a community. Uh, but what we call a, a symbol also is an archetype. Yeah. that you find in many different representations and in many different contexts. So, yeah. What I'm mostly fascinated by is how early on we humans have used the natural world and mm -hmm. its cycles as symbols and that these must be a universal language. And so there in France, you have the Lascaux Cave Mm -hmm. And you have the researcher, Chantal, I cannot pronounce her last name, has gone around and looked at many of the painted caves in France and elsewhere and found star charts. We first interviewed Frank Edge on this, um, on, on how we recognize patterns, and he was seeing, um, and she's gone far beyond that by looking at even the famous Hall of Bulls and its placement and uh, how it would be the well, this is what Frank was saying early on in the mid 90s. He was saying that the stars that they saw out the cave entrance at Lascaux would be um, this sky at this time in the summer, and then the other panel, because it's in a two, one ledge and one ledge, would be the winter sky, and how this is so much like Hamlet's Mill is talking about the celestial patterns that we see cyclically in the night sky and how we attach mythical meanings to them and how they're embedded in symbology, yeah, in mythology around the world. Mm -hmm. And so what a language that is, isn't it? That's what's so fascinating to me about yeah. it. It's a shared language. You mm -hmm. can find the hints of it all over the world. Why do we not know more about that? Why are we not recognizing this as a language that our ancestors were using early on? And that you could see anywhere in the world. You look up at the night sky and you see that. And that these were symbols that were known. And that we still have the fragments of them to this day that we utilize. And here we look so paltry in our knowledge by comparatively. Yes, we have all this other knowledge, but we've lost that thread, that universal thread that anchors us, that shows us how to relate to the world around us, how to celebrate the world around us. So those are the languages that um, that I think are lost languages that we need to revive. Yeah, we need to reconnect ourselves. with our inner animal or our inner orientation being part of nature. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yes, yes Thank yes. you. Yeah. If a dung beetle can also roll his little ball up in alignment to the arm of the Milky Way, I mean, why can't we? For heaven's <laughs> sakes. I, I mean, for heaven's <laughs> sakes. So I would love uh -huh. to talk more. Would you consider coming back and being our guest on a Sunday and talking about languages and symbol and semiotics and what your what your understanding is? A passion of mine. Why I was an English major. Love languages in all of its many forms. Why not? Yeah, let's why talk not? about that. Okay. Thank you so much. Such a pleasure. All right. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Yeah. So we're going to go um, look back up at my screen here. Oh, I scrolled my screen down. Uh, Celia, I think that's yeah. who we have next. Here she is. Hi. There hey. you are. I'll just start by saying, <clears throat> pardon me, that Meta Patterns is one of my favorite books. It's one of the few that I've read more than once. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> pardon me. My allergies are really bothering me, so I sound like a very long smoker, even though I'm not. Um, oh, 
one of my, my question is, and I'll preface this by saying, uh, in case I say something that is quite elementary, is that this is not my field of study. I'm not a scientist. I'm not an academic by any means. I'm just a curious person. Perfect. Kind of touching on something that Miss Gardner had uh, brought up and um, Henshaw as well. Uh, at what point, since there is so much randomness, especially if you're looking at things mathematically, at what point are you we able to say confidently, yes, there is an inherent pattern there? Or what is the imposition of what is a survival heuristic and us to be able to see, be able to learn because that's how we learn is through pattern recognition. So, so it's kind of like a which came first and how do we justify that? In other words, what is what is truly just random? What is actually uh, inherent in the sense that our consciousness is imposing it? It's kind of like a side effect of our developed consciousness or what's intrinsic and in that it is a fruit of what would be this universal consciousness. Perfect question. Mm. Wow, yeah. Um, and I guess by random, you mean not by, by random, you mean sort of happenstance that it could have been different. Uh, I, I, I mean, what, one, one view of randomness is, you know, the jiggling of molecules in the air, but you mean a <clears throat> a, a, there is a, you see a pattern there, but can, it, is it, when is it not legitimate or legitimate or, or right. when the might legitimacy or, or like, or what is, what seems to be a pattern. And it's not that nature is actually creating it at the same rate or at the same frequency as any other shape or type. Mm -hmm. It's a matter of just because it's the most efficient, it's what we are seeing the most. And so it's like the environment has determined that or what is truly intrinsic. I mean, people might say the constellations in the sky would be a good example of the human Mm -hmm. ability to, to make patterns imposing itself on because you know the fact that the stars are different distances but to us they look like you know a, a, a big dipper or a great bear or, or, or something um uh so i think i i i, I guess uh Celia, is it yes um mm -hmm. i guess i would I, I would say i guess i'm, I'm thinking out loud because you asked me a question uh that that's that's something one one always has to ask oneself that to, to, to when, when am I imposing, when am I possibly imposing it as a human being, an incredibly pattern rich, patterning being, organism, what, whatever, versus, you know, see, seeing something that's there. I, I, I think that's, maybe that's uh, back to Gene Gardner's paradigm. That's another sort of mm -hmm. Mobius strip uh, thing where you think it's there and then you discover it's you and then you, and that's then, called creativity. It's called take yeah. a starting point and then play with it, dance with it, yeah. right? So I like the Mobius strip yeah. Uh, yeah. An analogy a lot. Mm. Uh, yeah. exactly. it, it doesn't mean it can't be, you can't be on one side or the other temporarily as you're, I, I, I would say that's part but of you're the- diving of, into the sea of all potential and pulling some- all, It's diving into that. the sea of all potential, yeah. yeah. So ex excellent question. Yeah. yeah. Thank excellent. you. Very existential, Thank you, isn't it? Thank you very much. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, oh, Monica. Uh, Monica. Uh, there she is over here. Hello. Mike. Good to see you again. Your mic on. Yep. Yeah. Your mic's still not on, Monica. There you go. Still Can you there. turn it on for her? No, I can't. Uh, okay. Just the bottom left hand corner. Oh, I got no. it. I got there it. There she is. Perfect. Hey, hey. Okay. Sorry back. about that. Um, there is one thing that comes up for me when I'm um, feeling maybe more of what my role is and where I enter in this conversation. And I know uh, we're talking a lot about Gregory Bateson here and Gregory Bateson, I mean, well, I love Gregory Bateson and I spent some time studying him. And I also studied Purse a little, and I tried to understand maybe a little bit of a difference in their point of view. And Tyler, maybe you can speak to this because you also mentioned, you know, I'm not a panpsychist. And um, my, my push, my feel is that, you know, okay, you, you spoke about the evolution of um, the patterns that within which we evolved and a very critical part of that evolution that the human consciousness has evolved within and and been a part of you know from our rep, you know from our uh, just the evolution of human consciousness here is we've gone through 
several centuries of rationalism that deeply separated mind from matter. And we're in that right now. And I, I just have this deep sense that if we had, you know, that what we're on the verge of, and I think that the fact that so many people are talking about patterns right now and seeing these patterns, what we're on the verge of is an, an act, actual leap in consciousness that allows us to recognize um, a new, that involves all this patterning, something very different than the metaphysics of being that sees things as separate. Mm -hmm. But in order for that to fully happen, we've got to go really deep. And I know that going into deep time is like, you know, it's linear in its own way you know okay, okay. Yep. but to bring the entire cosmos to bring existence itself into our frame of thinking you know what it means to exist okay. and to move away from a center you know um and that's not something Gregory Bateson was willing to do he imagined this as happening only um where, the mental the interior it, as something that could only happen with the living but I want to feel it in existence itself. And, and, and that's where that leap comes in. And I just would give one example, like, you know, one way of maybe entering this conversation to give the suggestion of that would be how we think about paradox. And, you know, paradox results from, um, okay, so if you've got cause and effect that becomes circular, or more complex, okay, then that means that, that, that this, the description of you know, our consciousness mapping onto those sequences, we're using a timeless logic. All of our science and our physics and everything is yes. timeless. I, I agree. And, and so then it becomes self-contradictory, but, but paradoxes, um, okay. The way out of a problem, even for Bateson, would be to say that paradox is um, uh, is uh, it, it's coming from the if then of logic, which is timeless, but but the world itself developing is not timeless. So it be, it's an oscillation, always right. Right. or a complementarity. Right. right. So <laughs> that speaks to existence. In fundamental metaphysics, which I would like to get at changing so that we could have this leap of being that it is not separate, that goes beyond the rational scientific yeah. mind. So would you say that these, these patterns, these meta patterns or isomorphisms or various words, system processes, that they, they, they do exist in, in a kind of a, um, affordance space or possibility space that that is is not really in time but then they get manifested as the way that here's i'm putting my interpretation but i'm seeing if you agree because i'm trying to use some of your language uh, that there is there is some eternal aspects to some of this as well as time i mean you're saying eternity and time are paradoxical i, I think rather, i would not i would rather not separate eternity from from uh or to think, I would rather not, I, I think there's a way of not separating the eternal from what is present right here, that somehow eternal okay. is already present. So okay. if we can think in terms of these patterns and we can extend yes. it to all of existence, yes. then, then um, you know, we, we, we have to abstract into right. our patterns to, right. to understand anything at all. So I think the patterns can, can help mm -hmm. get there. Yes, I do. Yeah, I fully, I fully. I agree. Believe that, in, in from experience. Uh huh. Okay. I, I I agree, and and I'm hoping that we can get there. But in order to do it, I I just think we need to go all the way down, all the way down, and not separate a bio semiotics from you know a semiotics of the universe, and not separate. Um, not, uh, but not now, but now you're now you're in the thing of you're going to need. You know, anytime you make a word, you're making a distinction in a way, um, but it, it doesn't have to be an absolute distinction. The, 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 this is the, the, maybe the idea of a, of a dynamic border. I mean, you, we're not going to get rid of difference. We're not going to get rid of 
interesting. If, there, if there's difference, that, that's right after the Big Bang, there's no difference. That's kind of a boring universe. All that, ex all that existed was the potential though, all this potential. You and I, it, it always gets me to think that you and I existed in potential right after the Big Bang. Well, right, and I think that wow. potentialities are Thank real. You. Beginning of our arc. Yeah. I do too. Yeah, so those, those po so I like to think in terms of actuals and potentials rather than, than um, yes. the separate mind matter, consciousness. Oh. Yeah, I I think I do agree that the actual potential, I, I, I do I do agree that that's a, a better path for us as a uh, as a tool than mind and matter. I do I do agree actual potential is a much much more powerful tool. If I, I mean I, I you probably bristle at the word tool too. I don't whatever substitute whatever word you want. No, I, 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 I'm, a I, vehicle, I'm vehicle, a, a transport, a transport vehicle, or something like that. Mm -hmm. A helper, yeah. a spirit helper. I don't know. That, that, uh, um, so that, these are that, handy roadmaps. The word spirit. These are these are handy roadmaps, but we don't want to mistake them for the reality of which we're talking about. They're just handy ways of of getting at a subject, right? You you yeah. mentioned that you studied the ocean with your students, and you had to map out zones. Right. right. And yeah. one zone that was of particular interest to me is how whales can get down. Explain this one. I really wanted to know. About they can get down in terms of the pressure, the salinity, the whatever it is. And then their voice can echo half an ocean away. They can send out their voice yeah. and other whales can hear them half an ocean yeah. away. But that doesn't yeah. happen everywhere in the ocean. It happens only in a certain zone. Yeah, so so certain zones have different qualities. Yeah. The, um, the among density. The, 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 you know, so there Different is individuation zones, yeah. within the unity, yeah. diversity yeah. within the unity. Yeah. Right? And so yeah. you need to be able to speak about those. Right? And that's, an, that's another uh, kind of uh, a good vehicle, diversity and unity. Uh, yeah. You know, the, the, inter the, the simultaneous uh, sensing of the, the, the two together. It's, uh, I, okay. Thank you, Monica. Yeah. Monica, <laughs> always Monica. good. Yeah. Always Thanks. good to see you. <laughs> Did you have further thoughts? Further thoughts? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Parts and wholes, diversity, unity, parts and wholes, but that requires the whole. Uh, yep. So, yep. So the whole is all the way down, you know, in, in yep. so. Right. Yep. 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 That's another one. You're bringing up great. Uh, and that's why it's a beautiful state of mind to be in that space where the center is everywhere, the boundaries are nowhere. Mm. To be oh. the tiny point and yeah. all of creation simultaneously, right? Yeah. It's a beautiful yes. state of mind. We next have yeah. Sister Margaret. Sister Margaret, you're on. Okay. Well, thank you, Sider, for a very thought-provoking presentation. Um, I have lots of questions, but one of them is related to your mention of hierarchy and holarchy. Uh, have you discovered any hierarchical patterns in nature? It strikes me that all of our institutions, both civic and ecclesial, are built on hierarchical patterns. Mm. And I don't see those in nature. And I'm wondering if the solution is partly in designing some based on non-hierarchical and do you know anybody who has written uh, or done work on design of non-hierarchical based on nature? Well, that book I cited of um, Niall Ferguson, the, the Tower in the Square, you probably would be interested in that therefore, because he's, he's, he's looking at hierarchy and non-hierarchy throughout history. Uh, and taking p other people's analysis of, of networks of type. What, so what you're, what you're talking about is types of networks and it depends on how you define hierarchy. I personally would like this to move to a world, I, I think like you, of, of more individual empowerment at all levels and a, a kind of a less hierarchical world. I, I, I actually think our, our, all our governmental structures are too hierarchical all, all over the world. That'd be my personal opinion. These, I'm, um, I'm not a political scientist and these things would be very difficult to, to change. 
but it, it, if but um, at the same time, hierarchy in which some individuals have some. Um, so, so I was part of a big university, New York University, you know, a huge, a huge institutional system. And there is some there is some hierarchy there, of course, you know, there's a president and there's chairs of departments and deans of uh, dean, uh, deans of divisions or deans of uh, schools. I'm, see, I'm forgetting the uh, the hierarchy now, uh, but but it's it, it's it's kind of a soft hierarchy in some ways. I mean, the, you know, faculty have a lot of a lot of power, but but it, but I I remember thinking, well, I wouldn't want every faculty member in the university to have to make the decision about every single thing. Like it would totally be impossible. So we are faced, and I don't have this worked out because it's not my profession and I haven't thought enough about it, but we are faced with the issue of what well, Rousseau talked about, the, the collect, those that are sort of working on the behalf of the collective, um, like how, how, you do, how you distribute the individual interest and the collective interest when not everybody can be participating. Well, that's democracy. You, you participate by voting those to speak for you in a larger system, and you, uh, people are working uh, on this. But I, I, I suggest the book, maybe the Tower in the Square, at least to at least to stimulate your idea. But there's a lot out there about, well, even even with the um, the, the 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 crypto the crypto stuff, there's these non hierarchical. They, they, there's a name for it. Uh, I forget the name. Blockchain. De DeFi or something decentralized. Yeah, blockchain. But there's there's a word for like de decentralized groups. That they, there's a little code word, D D D E something, D in there. Um, the but uh, it, it, but anyway, I would say there's advantages and disadvantages to both. You know, and then I'm you get you get into nature. You get into some. I mean, you say there's non-hierarchical structures in nature, but some some animal social groups have a very strong power structure order. So if that's what you mean by hierarchy, then there are some hierarchies in nature. But I and don't primate groups and insect groups. Yeah, um, is, is, but it depends on yeah. Poison. And yeah. The hierarchy is defined in different ways by different people too. So that's a whole issue there, just how you what exactly what what you meet what you are personally meaning by the word hierarchy. But it's a great question. Yes, I, and Sister Margaret, you're part of a hierarchical religion. <laughs> so it's interesting how you have put out your thoughts on following uh, nature's patterns as well. Yeah. So. Anyway, you you motivated me to think more about that. Okay, thank you, Sister Margaret. Cool. Yeah. Cool. she's the biologist as well, by the way. Yeah. Oh perfect. wow. Okay. <laughs> Congratulations on your merging. Yeah, the merging yes. the two. she spans many worlds. Yeah, um, she's many. quite the lady. So shout yeah. out. I think I have. Okay, I have to leave in a few minutes. I'm really sorry. I, this is such an, a fabulous conversation. I met Tyler at uh, the memorial celebration of Lynn Margulis. Oh. And uh, I've been, I had been reading his book before I met him. I was really thrilled to meet him. <laughs> and it's one of my favorite books. I, what I really appreciate is how you've uh, combined the physical world with the cultural, human, psychological, linguistic um, world. And um, because the other people that I had read, like uh, Peter Stevens' Patterns in Nature and Philip Ball's book, uh, The Self-Made Tapestry, are marvelous from the point of view of explaining the physics or chemistry or other natural um, you know, causes of these patterns. But anyway, I wanted to, my, my final comment was just as an artist, I don't have such a big problem about all these categories and of thinking because when you're doing a, a painting, it's all happening and it's not yeah. verbal. And I started a painting once that was a, a cell, it was supposed to be a cell in the upper left corner. And as I painted, it started to look like a head with a big eye. In it. And then I thought, oh, okay. Uh, and the, and the, the membrane of the cell is really like a skin and I have a skin. So that this cell became the head of a body and the, the cell membrane became the skin of the whole human body. But the most interesting thing, and this is completely unplanned. That's what's so amazing. You can't plan it and think it all out because it doesn't make any sense logically, verbally, is that when I got to the mouth, I had this big kind of 
shape coming out of the mouth. And, and I thought, oh, that's kind of like breath. You know, the breath is something that comes out of our mouth. But then there was this kind of bubble. Well, then you kind of look for some analogy or, and it, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's the way the brain works. And so yeah. then yeah. it's like a thought, right? And a, a thought is a container or this breath is a container for thoughts. Yeah. And then the whole oh. thing becomes this endless <laughs> kind of, and I don't have time to post the picture. <laughs> I'll I'm envisioning a mind map and uh, spheres well, and lines connecting them in a network. Yeah. Also, Phil, I've been reading a lot about a Feynman, Richard Feynman. Yeah. He did not write a lot. And his lectures, he, he did a lot of his thinking while he spoke. But his one of his greatest contributions to physics was, were his diagrams. He could put into a diagram something that another physicist had to write a page of formulas, which hardly anybody could understand. But the diagrams were very easy to grasp the essential message mm -hmm. with. So, mm -hmm. I, anyway, I have to go. I wish I could. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Did, 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 did you, did you put you a link that. to your art in the? In I the will picture? put my website into the chat. Oh, good. The chat. And then. Um, and, and while you while you're doing that, I yeah, I want to say her art is really. Uh, it, 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 I mean, she gave a great description of, of what it is. It's all this combined into a sing, uh, single complex uh, interrelated imagery and uh, I'm, I'm impressed that uh, that that she, that you 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 and you remembered your process during this part too yeah. that's really interesting well that is maybe the most interesting part because um, and you described and, it yeah because I, I I studied process painting for quite a while with a master teacher and we it's all a, so I had to unlearn almost everything I knew about art all those rules about perspective and proportion and and it's really painting from the being this kind of unconscious and your attention is on your process and you don't care about the product i mean i happen to care because i, I call myself an artist but i mean really i it's not the most important part but i'm happy to share my artwork and i'm going to put my website on okay. the chat it's cybermuse.com, modern cyber and muse, ancient muses. So thank you, Tyler, for the call out. Thank you, <laughs> yeah, thank you for joining us today. Okay, yeah. it was a pleasure. I'll see you again. Bye-bye. Please come back. Uh, I just want to mention the idea of randomness in nature comes up with jumping genes and how DNA has infected certain species and actually changed their DNA, changed the course mm. of their evolution. Mm. And isn't that rather random? Yes, I mean, that there would is be an example, example of the random kind of a yeah. variation, create the creation of variation. Yep. 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 That's, that's a, I mean, it's just happenstance. Laura, Laura I, love, I love how much science interest in science you have in your um, uh, in, in your mind that you My can repertoire. She carries the repertoire. Re repertoire. Yep. Well, I'm an inch deep and a mile wide. Yeah. I'm a generalist. Yeah. yeah you're doing well. Yeah. Um, John is up next. John, you want to turn on your uh, mic and everything? Yeah. Yeah. Once again, it was such a rich conversation, and uh, there's so much uh, so much that's brought up. And Tyler, I'm still thinking about the last talk that you gave, like mm -hmm. a little three weeks ago. And uh, at that during that talk, you mentioned. And you had in this talk too, talking about the word level. And, and some of us were talking about that a little bit. And I've been thinking about that ever since. Like you, suggest, you asked me, and I was like, I don't have to provide the answer to that, but it's a, it's a great question. Uh, that the word level, like today, I feel like some of the things you were saying are so richly three-dimensional. And anyway, I was thinking about the term level. And then I started thinking about the term or the word field. And a field is interesting, it's ambiguous. People are talking about language and paradox. And I think probably what's so amazing about language is that the words need to have some commonality. Otherwise, how would we have any idea what we're talking about? But they have to allow for- Poetry new, is what you're talking about. Yeah, poetry, new ways of, of, of being put together in, in different relationships. So language and poetry and dance and rhythm and the ecstatic rituals and stances that process we do, they're all ways of, and you were asking Tyler today about how come all these people are doing different things. It's almost like, well, 
there's a saying, I think, in the I Ching somewhere is that everything, everyone has to see beyond themselves. That it, it, when, when you're talking about um, a rocket, I think a snake and a, um, a dolphin. Yes. Uh, that's really interesting. They're, they have similar shapes, but in a certain way, they're really radically different because a dolphin lives in a, a very liquid environment and its movement, even though it can be unidirectional, it lives in a three-dimensional realm. It's as mm -hmm. though we sometimes inhabit a, more of a two-dimensional realm when we're stuck in a kind of abstraction. And I feel like I'm jumping around because I'm more poetical, but the image you showed of Newton, I think is really fascinating because Newton is folded in half. He's in an extremely uncomfortable position. He's basically, I think, in a cave, maybe at the bottom of the ocean. He's not in a great spot there, but he's so intent on measuring something, and he's got what apparently is a compass in his in his hand, like this, right? Blake has another image of your reason or your rising, which some people say is writhing reason, and he apparently is trying to measure the abyss. He's trying to measure what is the extent of possibilities, and it's like he's never going to succeed in this. And so there's an inherent uh, like sense of of disappointment but the disappointment actually if we can accept that is a form of liberation you know so there's something that the dolphin can move like this and it can go like this and they seem to relish that you know but in the abstract realm like i'm not sure where i was going to use an example of language language is knowledge it's like an enclosure it seems like to be enclosing something and finalizing it but what you're seeing to be interested in and what everyone here is interested in the ongoing kind of interplay. So the other thing I would just say about level, I was listening to uh, Thich Nhat Hanh and he has the term interbeing. So a field or level, but there's an interfield. So a field can both be a place, but it's relationships and it's also energy. He says, you know, Buddhist term is a term called signlessness. He says, there's an appearance of things, differentiation, of course there are, but he said, a flower is made of all non-flower elements. And then he kind of smiles and he says, a flower is made of the sun, a flower is made of the cloud, a flower is made of soil. Mm -hmm. And that it's almost like a form of, and I think other poets say, um, D.H. Lawrence, I think would say, like, uh, we are transmitters of things and when we fail to transmit, we die. You know, we are transmitters of energy. So there's something about what you're talking mm -hmm. about, uh, yeah. everyone, which I, I think I've, I've already gone beyond what, no, My great, time. great, 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 great. I, I'm, lo I'm loving everything you're saying, the connections you're making there, the way you you started off with the you know the rocket dolphin and, and snake, but then you know expanded into the interbeing of yeah. Nat Han. And uh, yeah, that that's a great word. And also yeah. you're you're I, I'm I'm also unhappy with any particular word like level, field, you know, they all have sort of good yeah. and bad aspects of them. I mean, even the combo genesis, it's not a, it's not yeah. a level, like a horizontal level, like that word implies that yeah. yeah. the system is people talk about levels of organization and they don't mean that they mean, but, right. but we don't, we don't have good words for this concentricity right. of, I like yeah. nested, yeah. I like nestedness. I like ne uh, nestedness in a way. Um, you didn't yeah. use that particular term, but anyway, great, great. Uh, Tyler, if I could say one more thing about, about language in this sense, like, we sometimes, because I'm, you know, as a typical American, unfortunately, English is my go-to language because it's the only one I can really speak, you know. And other languages, though, like Robin Walls Kimmerer talks about her native language she's lost and she's trying to recover. But Potawatomi, she says that in their language, like a we, I live in a hilly region and there's a south hill and a west hill and a, you know, east hill. She said, we would never say that, that we would say, they are healing. There's a healing going on mm. over there. You know, mm. they're, they're, the closest yeah. they'd be like gerundical. We live in a gerundical world. But uh, so when we think in terms of language in this sort of way, like like poets, I think they're, they're key into this. Novalis, who died in early 1800s, said, the seat of the soul is where the inner and outer world meets, and it is whole at every point of the overlap. That is like an incredibly complex metaphor. The sea of the souls where the inner out and it's hold every point of the overlap. That is like a, some kind of a holographical thing, but it's almost as though that the, that the boundary is not, this is not a boundary. You can say it's a boundary, but our hand is in touch with every organ in our body. If I touch this, my, my stomach wants to know, oh, can I eat that? No. <laughs> and I, our whole hand is designed to touch. 
yeah, yeah. But it's like it goes it goes from here all the way in and from there all the way out. So I yeah. think your thing talking about I think it's beautiful what you're saying about think of a sphere, not to get stuck in that, but as a sphere like why is this shape that shape? You know, and like I think of the of the dolphin as being sort of like a like an ovoid shape, you know, because it can turn and go through space in a way that human beings would seem kind of more it's aerodynamic. Final. Right, yeah. it's ergonomically yeah, designed yeah, yeah, yeah. to do what it needs to do. You know, I appreciate that direct experience cannot convey everything in words, but it is the carrier waves that we have to connect with one another. And I appreciate that you mentioned the the container, the shield up about our our. I I see our worldview as getting breaks in it, so that momentarily we can glimpse infinity through conversations like this, through contemplation like this, through understanding. The, the patterns is, is one avenue to do that, to yeah. glimpse the universe, behold it at large, to have that direct experience yeah. a little bit more. There's one, one other thing, and I promise I'm going to stop. I, I heard this, this person, he's <laughs> very cool, talking about cuneiform. And uh, they found in, in somewhere mm -hmm. in ancient Mesopotamia uh, certain games that people play. But anyway, he said cuneiform is like this. He said, if you imagine a thread, and on the thread you have beads, and on each bead there may be seven different pictures. Any word can mean seven different things, and they could be as different as a chair and a shoe. In order to read that sentence, you would essentially have to spin the first bead. So in your mind, you're sort of aware of, you're not thinking this is a rock or this is a you know, suitcase. It has potential. Then you spin the second one, the third one, the fourth one. And it's not really until you see the whole picture that you can really it kind of comes together that 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 thought pattern comes together which is an extraordinary thing like how could people ever have read that way but he said actually <laughs> once you practice that you can do it and that's really what's happening all the time uh but we're not really aware of it and of course our language is not not nearly as flexible as that but we i have think to it's understand the way we are it's not the only way to be right yeah, that's amazing. one of the gifts of anthropology <laughs> Uh, in movement, yeah, yeah. But anyway, thank you very much. You mentioned cuneiforms, and I'd love to ask lawyers and accountants, and I should ask Sister Margaret as well. Why is it that fully one third of the cuneiform tablets, of which there are many, 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 many thousands, one third has to do with law, one third has to do with accounting, and one third is religion? Mm. What does that say about us? Mm. Right. Yeah. But thank you, John. Really, thank some John. wonderful. You. And you mentioned the shape of the Ovid, and it reminds me, because yeah. you use the uh, image of uh, the North Coast Salish people uh, as part, when you turn off your camera, we see the Salish image, and that's always designed from the Ovid as the main uh, design glyph, of, uh, glyph yeah. of all of the designs that they create in the artwork, but it represents their, their stories and their traditions. And so it's, it's, and the other thing you mentioned yeah. I was going to mention was, is that we did this interview with Thomas Horse. That I uh, that's published as a podcast, and he talked about something very similar too. He said, I, I, "I'm going to share you share with you some stories of our rituals and our understandings, but there's so much lost because we have to put it in English. English doesn't yeah. have doesn't have it doesn't have the ability to tell the stories the way we tell stories because there's so many different levels of the meaning to how we say it as a as a uh, uh, Lakota." Person. And it reflects our yeah. worldview. Yeah. And the, so, anyway, thank you so much for jo well. joining the conversation, John. Thank you. Your enthusiasm yeah. is just a delight. Yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah. Uh, I think Tony had to go to a meeting because he was the next one up. So, oh, no. Uh, that's okay. Oh. Uh, that was our... So no more hands are up. So does any else still want a question or want us to uh, kind of wrap it up? Because <laughs> this is a uh, powerful... We haven't even done the every after time, party yet. Every time we yeah. have a discussion with T Tyler, well, last time was an hour, it was two and a half hours. This has been... The actual recording time is two and a half hours. So, okay. uh, yeah, yeah. All right. Right, so we can stop the recording and uh, end our conversation. Well, what about uh, maybe um, somebody put it in the chat room? Well, we can go through this even without recording. Uh, I would like to hear from Krista Mariah, Laura, if you're still there's up. There's literally yeah. three Maybe this is a good time to close the recording, and maybe some people do want to. Sure, sure. Let's okay. Do that. that was Let's your do request. That. Let me do that now. So thank, thank you, you so all much. for coming. <laughs> conversation for exploration. See you next time. <laughs> Here we go. Three, two, one. Oh, well, we have to say goodbye. I need that on the recording. Yeah. Right? And the thank you, official. Yeah. Okay. Right? I can cut this out and clean this up. Okay. <laughs>
We want to thank Tyler Volk. Tyler, thank you so much. It's just been a delight with all of these wonderful uh, folks that you brought to this uh, forum today and our regular uh, attendees. Mm -hmm. And just the, the dance that we have with the universe the in this yes. way, just the dance that we have with the forms, the symbols, the patterns, um, just how the universe speaks to us and that we can understand what we are, what we are made of. We are made of these dynamical forces, forces these potentialities, these unfoldings. Um, where, you know, Newton had his mission, let me look at the handiwork of God to truly understand her. Yeah. Um, and we're doing the same thing, are we not? Isn't that what all of life is about? Understanding the world around us mm -hmm. and our place in it and to celebrate that. And you've uh, helped us do this in so many beautiful ways with all the threads that you put together, the many disciplines. I wish more scientists were enamored of the disciplines around them as you are and mm -hmm. finding the connections between them. Yeah, finding I, the relations. This is what society is about, finding the relations between us, us as moving parts. And, uh, and yeah. what's the dialogue here? So thank you for that. Yeah, what do you want so to say? Oh, that's thank it was, I really enjoyed the shout outs because he went and he oh, brought yeah. forth so much data for me. I mean, if we go buy all the books, you better have at least a thousand bucks in your pocket because <laughs> so, there's so much research here to, to be digested. Yeah, it's the hours, the hours yeah. to digest it. But that's what I appreciate about you all coming on is, hey, you know, have the dialogue. Right. Let's move well, the dial. Well through done, dialogue. well done. So, so we thank, thank you so much, Tyler. Yeah. All right. Very welcome.